Order, order. Welcome to the Tax Prof Court. I'm here to help guide you through one of the most difficult areas of all tax law, judicial sources of tax law. We're gonna talk about many issues, focusing on the US legal system, how a taxpayer can file a claim in court against the government, and how a taxpayer can go all the way from trial court to the Supreme Court of the United States. Now, as I mentioned, this is a very difficult area of the tax law, but also very important. Think back to the beginning of US history in the Supreme Court case, Marbury v. Madison, when Justice John Marshall focused on the importance of the US legal system and in interpreting law. And that's also important when it comes to tax. All right, let's go ahead, let's jump into it. Judicial sources of tax law. We're gonna cover many learning objectives and topics. We're gonna to describe the structural relationship among the federal courts that hear taxation cases. We're gonna talk about the detail the constitution of and the procedures concerning each element of the federal court system hearing tax cases. We're going to use proper citation conventions for each of the courts that hear tax cases, recall where tax court cases are published for use by tax researchers, including looking at citations. We're going to describe conditions under which the practitioner might choose each of the trial court level courts for a client's litigation, the tax related matter. We're going to illustrate working with the format and content of a court case brief, and we're gonna understand and navigate a court opinion for the different tax court levels. The topics include the federal court system, legal concepts and briefings, the US tax court, which is the main court of original jurisdiction for tax cases, US district courts, US court of federal claims, the US court of appeals, US Supreme Court, and we're also gonna talk about case briefs and head notes. All right, let's go ahead and start by the very high level, just talking about the third branch of government, which is the judiciary. Remember that when you're looking at the government, go back to your American government class. We've got the executive branch, we got the legislative branch and the judicial branch. So the legislative branch, which is where we have Congress, Congress writes the tax laws in the US code, internal revenue code. The executive branch, which is the president and the president appoints the Secretary of Treasury, and then under the Secretary of Treasury, the Treasury Department, we have the Internal Revenue Service, which administers and enforces the tax law. So that's the executive branch. And the third branch is the judiciary. So I have videos on all three of these. This one focuses on the judicial branch and case law, but there are videos on legislative sources of tax law and administrative or executive sources of tax law. So the third branch, again, is the judiciary. The role of the judiciary is to resolve cases and controversies under the law. You might recall, thinking back to U.S. history, U.S. government, a case called Marbury v. Madison, where Justice John Marshall, a long time ago, the beginning of U.S. history, basically he emphasized in Marbury v. Madison the importance of courts in interpreting the Constitution and federal law. So it's extremely important here since we're dealing with federal tax law. So a decision of the court is a rule of law. So courts can interpret the tax law itself. There are different tax courts we're gonna talk about, different, I shouldn't say tax courts, but different courts where a tax, a federal tax case can be brought. And through the US Constitution, the Grand Constitution, those courts are set in place to hear those issues. So a decision of the court is a rule of law and thus a source of tax authority when case deals with tax issues. Now, as we saw in legislative, uh, the legislative discussion, the legislative tax authority, the code is very broad. It's not very specific when you get down to the weeds and to the facts of a specific case. The executive branch, while there are regulations, revenue rulings, rev procs, which can be binding, it might there might not be enough factual relevancy in a, with um, like the level of case law. Case law, there's lots more cases out there than revenue rulings, rev procs, regulations, but then there's issues of whether a certain case it applies to a taxpayer or not based on jurisdictional concerns. So we have to think about all that. There's of course lots of administrative uh, non-binding authorities like private letter rulings, technical advice memorandum, chief counsel advice, which all that stuff really gets into the weeds. We're looking for binding authority and case law potentially can be that. All right, let's go ahead and let's continue on. 
So this is kind of an overview of some of the issues that we're gonna be talking about in this presentation. I just wanna go through some of these items here to focus on it. So again, this is federal tax law. So it's the federal court system that we're dealing with. It's a federal court system. We're not gonna apply it differently at the state levels for federal. Now, if you're dealing with a state tax issue, you would be going to a state tax court or a state court to hear a tax case, I should say, not the federal court. But if it's a federal tax issue, it's gonna be a federal court system. In disagreement with the IRS, the, um, the taxpayer may use the court system. That should be in disagreement with the IRS, comma, sorry. The taxpayer may use the court system to recover an overpayment, which in that case, basically the taxpayer will pay the tax assessed by the IRS. So this is what's going on in, in, the, in the grand scheme. As you know, taxpayers must file file a tax form by a certain deadline. So let's just say it's an individual and they're filing April 15th deadline. Or let's say they extend, so they have to file October 15th. They get a six month extension. So they file their tax return by 1015. Let's say they file on the 13th of October. They file it. A few years later, they hear from the IRS and they're auditing their tax return. And there's basically a deficiency that's being sent by the IRS saying, you in inaccurately reported your income or you took more deductions than you need to and you owe us a thousand dollars in taxes so the taxpayer can either pay the tax and then sue for a refund which is recover an overpayment or the taxpayer can go through the tax court system with the statutory notice period the 90 day period night get a 90 day letter and then they can they can go to tax court and not pay and then the tax court can then rule and then a payment would be required so that's the idea. Now, you're gonna, we're going to find there's three different courts of original, jurisdi original jurisdiction where a taxpayer can start. That's what original jurisdiction means, where a, the case starts, not the appeals, the original trial court level. Two of those, you must sue for a refund. So again, recover an overpayment, taxpayers paid what the IRS is assessing, and the taxpayers, they're suing for a refund. Those include the federal district court, which is the main uh, trial court, for the federal for federal cases, the federal district court. There's different federal districts around the U.S. So that's one way through federal district court, and the other, and we're going to talk about both of these, the federal court of claims, federal court of claims, which is based in D.C., is going to be a riding circuit just like the U.S. tax court, but based in D.C. and it hears federal matters, a lot of patent cases, but it can hear tax cases as well. So it's cases brought where a party is suing the U.S. It's suing the U.S. since you're suing for a refund. The reverse deficiency assessment is solely the U.S. tax court. That's the only way. And you're going to see that's a major reason why taxpayers choose to go the U.S. tax court path rather than go the federal district or the federal court of claims path. Because with the U.S. tax court, the taxpayer does not have to pay the tax to not have to pay to play. That's the idea is pay to play. I'll be using that phrase throughout the presentation, pay to play. So the IRS may use the court system to assert a claim to a de deficiency and force collection if they've already been determined to do that, but the taxpayer is not paying or impose civil or criminal criminal penalties. So those are multiple things. So deficiency, enforced collection, or impose civil or criminal penalties. Now, I will note that the IRS, so when it comes to recovering an overpayment, the taxpayer is the one suing. That's the only case that happens. The US government doesn't sue the taxpayer. It's the, the taxpayer always sues the, the, um, the government. When it comes to the reverse a deficiency assessment, the taxpayer or the IRS can actually initiate the tax court from that, that actually taking place, that actually taking place. It can be either party, but you're going to learn later that the tax court, the taxpayer is always the petition, petitioner and the respondent is always the IRS, always. So federal court cases, third primary source of tax, we just talked about that, right? We talked about the executive legislative, so keep that in mind in all this. Remember that there's other areas of tax law that you have to, it's not a vacuum, it's a package. Generally concerned controversial areas of taxation. So a lot of the cases, the idea is that most cases, most cases in the U.S. system, roughly about um, around 99% of cases, of court cases in the U.S. legal system, they settle. They settle, which means they don't actually get heard by, by the judge and an opinion rendered. So that's the same idea here. 
Usually, if a case is taking place, that means that there's some dispute of facts, dispute of law that's taking place, and the opinion's going to go through. There's occasionally times where it's obvious, you know, which side's going to win, usually government, and um, the taxpayer doesn't want to settle. Maybe they're stubborn in their ways. But the idea is that because so many cases settle, and there's the appeals at the IRS level, and there's just so many matters of appeal, and um, because there's just so much backlog of cases in the federal system, there's a huge incentive to settle, not only from the uh, tax, the attorneys representing the taxpayer, but also just just the idea that you know there's so many measures in place to settle, and and the IRS wants wants to also settle if possible uh, in in many cases. So that's the idea is that if you have a case opinion, there's probably something in there that there's something disputed. It's not that clear cut is the idea. Decisions answer questions regarding proper interpretation or intended application of tax law. So in the cases, they focus on questions of fact, questions of law, both a lot of times. That's the idea. All litigation begins at the trial court level. Those are the three courts we talked about above. The U.S. tax court is the main one. Then I would say probably the federal district courts. And then the third one is the federal court of claims. So those are really the, the three courts of original jurisdiction. The trial courts were where the courts originate, originate. We're going to talk about some appellate courts later on, but those are the main three trial courts. Often litigation that results in series of unexpected or innovative judicial decisions will result in legislation that codifies these decisions. Um, I don't, I say often, I don't think it's at, as often as it used to be. It definitely was at one point in the tax law when it was, when tax law was uh, much newer in the U S in the U S government, there are many code sections like section 212, um, that is the big one that comes to mind where at one time there was no section 212 dealing with investment activities. And because of the Higgins case, Congress, after the Higgins decision actually wrote the, actually wrote section 212 in the Internal Revenue Code to basically reverse what the Supreme Court said in Higgins. So that's a lot of times what Congress does, because remember the constitution gives the, the main authority to write tax law to Congress. And we're gonna talk about how the courts, they try not to be judicial activists and legislate from the bench, because again, the constitution puts the power of taxing, taxing authority into Congress. So the idea is that the courts, a lot of times, they don't want to tread into the legislative realm. However, there are times that it does occur and that's when Congress comes in and says, hey, we see the Supreme Court decision. We don't agree. Let's make our tax law. And of course, that's going to be binding because we know the Internal Revenue Code is the heart of tax. Okay, let's go on. There's a lot of stuff I said here. Again, I'm just introducing. We're going to talk about a lot of these things. All right. The court's authority. Questions of law versus questions of fact. I mentioned earlier that courts hear questions of law and questions of fact. So questions of law deal with an issue that must be resolved by interpreting a law that is unclear. So for example, if you look at code section 162 and you're looking at the def, at the, the general trader business expense requirements, section 162A specifically, and it says that a deduction is allowed if it's ordinary, necessary expense incurred in carrying on a trader business during the tax year. All of those phrases where I paused, those are all ideas. Those are all um, requirements, conditions that the taxpayer has to meet. So for example, it does a, is the expense ordinary? That has a line of case law that defines that. And defining what ordinary means, that would be a question of law. There is the Welch v. Helvering case, Welch v. Helvering case. That case deals with ordinary and necessary uh, for section 162. That's, a, that's an example, okay? So that's what a question of law is. Questions of fact, an issue of fact, the proof of which is uncertain. The decision maker must determine whose version of facts to believe. So most tax cases focus more on the questions of law, but there will be times where questions of fact arise as well. Now, if you're taking my tax research class, we almost fully focus on the uh, questions of law because I give you the facts and we assume that they are undisputed by the parties, but there will be times where they will be disputed. Okay. We're actually going to take a look at opinion later on. And one of the issues is the court, and it's not something that we're dwelling on, but the court had to determine the breakup of damages between punitive and compensatory damages. And we'll talk about that. And that's, that could be seen as, well, it's a matter of law. It's also a matter of fact, because it affects the classification. So query, 
Which question should carry more authoritative weight to a tax practitioner and researching a tax problem? So let me go ahead. Let me just pause. I think you should pause the video and think about this. Think about what I've said. The answer, questions of law because they involve interpretations or explanations of the law itself. And the reason why it's so important is because as I always say, the Internal Revenue Code is just so broad. Regulations, while they get a little bit more narrow, more narrow they're still very broad and providing uh, interpretations of the law. So questions of law helps taxpayers tremendously in, in, using, in using these cases to determine tax outcomes. Questions of fact are taxpayer specific and carry little weight in terms of other cases. Questions of law as applied to the facts carry authoritative weight as case law decisions often involve the application of the law to the facts. So the last point there is saying that a lot of cases, it's both a question of law and question of fact. And if, if that's what's going on, then the factual portion of it is more relevant to others because it's showing you how to apply the law to facts. Courts will defer to Congress lawmaking authority. So that's what I was referring to earlier. There's, an, there's this phrase called judicial activism. And the idea is that judges in general, they, don't, they shouldn't be legislating from the bench. That's not their realm. And remember, Constitution, the Constitution states that the taxing authority is given to Congress. So if Congress is the one that's able to enact tax law in specific areas, if they go through that, that formal process and it's, it's, it's all constitutional, then that's, the Constitution allows that. The judiciary is meant to interpret when it comes to there's issues of applying that law along with the executive branch as well. So judicial activism is saying that, okay, well, the courts aren't going to come in. They're going to make new law. That's not what Congress intended. That's the idea. So courts will not invalidate a tax law enacted by Congress, except in a clear case of unconstitutionality. So if there's some due process or some aspect of the constitution that's being affected by a tax, then that would be an example. That would be an example where the constitution doesn't allow it. Courts will invalidate an interpretation as contrary to legislative intent. They can do that. So one thing the courts can do is they are allowed to interpret. Again, remember Justice John Marshall, Marbury versus Madison. Marbury versus Madison. That case, very important case when it comes to judicial interpretation of U.S. and federal law. The idea of stare decisis is important in any area of case law in the U.S. It's the cornerstone of the U.S. economy, or I'm sorry, not just the legal system, but just the, but also the U.S. economy. It's one reason why the U.S. economy has been so strong over time is because of the U.S. legal system, and it all goes back to this idea of stare decisis, which is a Latin phrase, and we're going to look at some other Latin phrases in a few moments, that means let the decision stand. It basically is the idea of precedent or precedence, precedent or precedence. A self-imposed court doctrine that states where we have reached a decision. So if the court has reached a decision, when I mean court, we're talking about jurisdictional issues. And we'll come back to that and I'll mention that in a moment. So if the court has reached a decision, apply the law in a certain way in the past, we will continue to follow that decision to resolve future similar controversies. So a few things I want to mention. First, court. So we're talking about court, we're talking about that court in the past or any courts that are above that court that that, that court must follow. So if you're looking at a the tax court, potentially all other tax court cases are can ba combined that tax court decision, even though it's a different judge, as long as that tax court case hasn't been overruled or there's something called the Golson rule we're going to talk about later on, make sure you write that down. It's a, a very important idea, Golson rule, and we'll explain that later on, but it deals with the different circuits that taxpayers reside in. Could be some differences there. But the idea is that if you're dealing with, so the Supreme Court, all, all courts are bound by the Supreme Court, even the Supreme Court itself. So all courts in the entire U.S., are bound by the U.S. Supreme Court because it's the highest law of the land. Then you have the circuit court appeals below that for the U.S. U.S. circuits, and they're bound by their circuit and the U.S. Supreme Court. They're not bound by other circuits. So that's what we're saying. We're saying the court. So if you're in the Ninth Circuit, circuit court appeals, that we're talking about, okay, a self-imposed uh, self court doctrine that states where we have reached a decision. So if the Ninth 
Ninth Circuit has reached a decision in the past. Ninth Circuit's going to follow that. Supreme Court's reached a decision in the past. Ninth Circuit's going to follow that. If it's in the Second Circuit, the Ninth Circuit does not follow that necessarily. They might, it might be persuasive, but if there's Ninth Circuit law already, they have to follow that. That's what the idea is. Why is this so important for the U.S. economy and, the, and our, our structure of our government? Because all about predictability. If we're able to look at opinions over time and we know, okay, well, this, this decision has not been overruled. It hasn't been overturned. Then we can apply, we can understand that the legal system is going to apply similar application so there's no open area about doing a transaction, making a transaction work. That's the idea. It's such an important aspect of the U.S. government and the U.S. economy. So here's stare decisis. Why is stare decisis an important doctrine? Well, I just talked about the importance for the U.S. economy in a macro level. The doctrine promotes certainty. So again, certainty is the key. Certainty is the key. Under the law, as individuals, we will know our rights and obligations under the law and can plan our actions accordingly. So if you're trying to plan a business, structure a business in a way where you want to avoid tax law. And by the way, their um, Justice Learned Hand, Justice Learned Hand, that's actually the name of a famous Supreme Court justice back in the early 1900s, Justice Learned Hand in a famous Supreme Court case said that taxpayers, they can arrange their affairs in a way that minimizes taxes. That's completely fine. That's the famous language you hear when you talk about tax planning. Justice Learned Hand in a Supreme Court case said that. If you want to go and look that up online, you'll find it. Justice Learned Hand said that. So the idea here is, for example, if a court decision permits a taxpayer to put an elevator in her house for medical reasons and deduct that portion of the cost, which exceeds the increase in value to her property as a medical expense, she may do so, in the, so another taxpayer can do so without worry of being assessed a deficiency. So the idea is that if you read a case and you know it's still good law and you see, okay, well, a taxpayer did X and I'm also thinking about doing that and they got that benefit and I want to get the benefit, so I'm going to do it, then you can rely on that. You're not just going to have like, okay, some uh, court come and say, oh yeah, there's that decision, but we're going to ignore it. And, ta and sometimes that does happen, but they, the way that, the way that uh, a judge needs to do that is to distinguish or overturn a previous case, which isn't as common as you think it is, okay? Isn't as common overturning previous cases. It's not as common. And you might be wondering, well, why, why do judges overturn decisions? Because as our economy, as technology, as society changes, then we have to overturn our for our societal impact, for our societal values, those ideas of our country. It's, you know, think about the U.S., when it first was created in the late 1700s and think about how it's grown and changed, right? Different industries have changed, right? When we first were a country, the biggest industry was agriculture. That's no longer the case. So things have to change. They have to evolve with the, with the respective, with the country and the economy and whatnot. And that's why previous decisions get overturned for, and there's other reasons as well, but, but that's a big element. Maybe Congress changes things and we have to overturn the way that something was interpreted in the past. So that's the idea. So it's all about certainty. And again, the idea is that if you want a tax benefit, you need to look to the previous um, case law or areas, and you can rely on that with certainty. And that's, again, a cornerstone of our US economy and why we have such a strong economy because of this reliance on or understanding the law and relying on that. Okay, so here's an overview of the court system. We're gonna be going in depth in all of these courts that are on this slide. So the taxpayer res, uh, resorts to the courts only after all administrative settlement options have been exhausted. So I mentioned earlier, I, the taxpayer files their individual tax return. They do so. The IRS approaches the taxpayer. Maybe a few years later, they get audited and they get a deficiency letter in the mail. There's a bunch of different options. I'm not going to go into the, all those options. There's the IRS appeals process. There's so many different options that can take place. There's settlement. There's negotiations that can occur. This could all take time. But at some point... Um, taking it to court may be considered. So trial courts are the courts of original jurisdiction. They are the, the first courts that hear the action. We have three. There's three. The U.S. tax court, the taxpayer does not have to pay to play, does not have to pay. So the idea is that the IRS is assessing a deficiency saying, hey, taxpayer, you have to pay X number of dollars. You didn't pay enough in taxes. So if you don't want to pay that, then 
you can go to the U.S. tax court. But if you want to go to the federal district court or the U.S. court of federal claims, you have to pay that deficiency and then sue for a refund. So pay to play is what it's what we refer to it as, pay to play. Now, as many of you know, in our U.S. court system, every tax, every, every citizen, every person that, that files a, a claim in the U.S. courts is entitled to an appeal, one level of appeal. Now, these trial courts, they appeal up, and I'm going to talk about specifically which ones appeal where, but they appeal up to the U.S. Uh, Circuit Court of Appeals, which are these two right here. And we'll talk about how you determine which circuit you're going to appeal to, but the idea is that you're able to appeal to that court. Now, the appellate the appellate court, they have the right to actually hear the, the whole case, hear the oral arguments and whatnot, or they can just simply just affirm the lower court and they don't have to hear the actual formal arguments, just so you know. But at least they reviewed the case is the idea. And then the U.S. Supreme Court is the final court. So anything that goes to the appellate courts from the, from a tax case, so it's got to go to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. And then if it wants to be appealed again, then it goes to the U.S. Supreme Court. And we're going to talk about that. And that is not guaranteed. That is not guaranteed to be reviewed by the U.S. Supreme Court. There's specific requirements that have to be met. It's called um, the writ of certiorari has to be granted. Four of the nine Supreme Court justices have to have to agree to hear a case. And we'll talk about that later on, but that's the idea. By the way, the number of geographic circuit courts of appeal, I left a blank here and I have a few other blanks in the slides because numbers, as you know, change. Right now there's 12 geographic circuit court of appeals. There's 11 numbered circuits and there's a DC circuit. So there are 12 geographic and there's a 13th, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. And we'll talk about that one later on, but that here is the U.S. Court of Federal Claims. All right, let's continue on. So here is the appeals, and as I mentioned, um, I talked about a lot of these things. So the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, it appeals directly to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals. That's the only one that appeals there. The U.S. District Courts and the U.S. Tax Court, if it's a regular or a memo decision, they appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals, which are the 12 geographic locations depending on where the taxpayer resides. So they have the 12 geographic locations. There's 11 numbered ones. I'm going to show you a map later on. And then there's the DC. So DC is included in that. And then finally, we're going to talk about there's three different U.S. tax court hearings that are, or there's really two, sorry. There's two different U.S. tax court decisions There's or hearings. There's regular tax court hearings, so regular hearings. And then there's the small division hearings, which are like more simplified. There's much more simplified. And the idea there is that no appeal is allowed. You give up your right to appeal, but there's, you might be saying, well, why would you ever want to do that? There's, it's more informal process. There's, there's more elements because one thing is that for the U S tax court, you can appear pro se, which means the taxpayer represents him or herself. You don't necessarily need an attorney. Do I recommend that? No, I think it's uh, very important to have an attorney. All right. Burden of proof. So the idea, many of you have seen Law and Order or different shows on TV, Legally Blonde, maybe movies where you see the court and all these different things and you see how a court operates. There's a big aspect of litigation and the court system is all about burden of proof. Who has to come in and prove with a certain percentage or preponderance of the evidence or reasonable doubt, whatever the, the standard is, who, who has to prove that in order to win the case? Well, in general, in tax, the burden of proof falls on the taxpayer to prove that the taxpayer does not have to pay the deficiency or needs or is suing for a refund and should get a refund. There are some cases where the burden of proof shifts um, to the IRS. And if you look under section, um, section 7491, if a taxpayer introduces credible factual evidence, um, if it's certain cases like the accumulated earnings tax, hobby classification, so like hobby losses, whether it's a hobby activity versus trade or business or investment, Fraud, fraud, certain fraud cases and penalty cases, criminal tax cases, all of those that's grouped in fraud. When the IRS uses statistics to reconstruct an individual's income, so a lot of times when a lot, of, we always talk about how a business might be a cash business because it's trying to avoid having to pay tax. Well, there are methods and ways that the IRS uses to reconstruct income. So if you've got a, a hot dog cart in New York City and it sells every, all its hot dogs, all its chips, all its drinks, 
that's all it sells, let's say, just those three items, and it sells it all for cash, the IRS can reconstruct an individual's income, that hot dog cart, and determine, okay, looking at other hot dog carts, maybe similar industry, and they should say, okay, well, you have X number of dollars. Now, some of you out there might be saying like, okay, well, the taxpayer might do X, Y, and Z to kind of conceal that they have that business, or how does the IRS even know they have that business? Just think of Al Capone. They see this lavish lifestyle, underreporting income, that's the idea. Again, there's lots of taxpayers. There's this thing called the tax gap where the government reports how much tax um, how much tax revenue should be raised and how much is actually raised. The idea there is that they know that there's a lot of taxpayers out there that aren't properly reporting and it's a lot to do with the cash businesses. So it's reconstructing an individual's income. If the IRS is doing that, the burden of proof in that case falls in the IRS. The court proceeding against any individual taxpayer involving a penalty, as I mentioned earlier, penalties or additional additions to tax, those are also, those burdens of proofs or those situations, the burden of proof is on the IRS, not the taxpayer. Let's talk about some common legal terminology. If you're taking my tax research class, it's really important that you learn these. I could ask about any of these on an exam. A lot of these are extremely important. The reason why they're so important is because you're gonna see in cases, they refer to a lot of these, these phrases, a lot of Latin phrases as well. And for those of you not in my class and you're just watching this, very important for practice, if you're taking another tax research class, let's just go through each of these. So the first one, Latin phrase, ad valorem. You've probably heard about this one already. According to value is what it means. So it's used to designate assessment of taxes based on property value. Next, we have appellant, the party appealing a decision to a higher court. So that's the party that lost at the lower court. So they lost the lower court level. And the appellee is the opposite party. So the appellee is the party that is on the other side. It's no longer plaintiff and defendant. We don't call them that, or we don't call them petitioner and respondent. We call them the appellant and the appellee. That's the idea. So next is bona fide or bona fide, in good faith and without fraud or deceit. Sorciari or writ of certiari is the process by which the U.S. Supreme Court agrees to hear a case from a lower appellate court's decision, so the U.S. Court of Appeals. And the idea there is that you're going to need four of the nine Supreme Court justices, so four of the nine justices on SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States, to actually hear a case, to grant, it's called granting certiari, so granting Certiar, grant cert. Grant cert is kind of how, is, is how we phrase this. Collateral estoppel. When factual issue determined by valid judgment, the same parties cannot litigate that factual issue again in future litigation of the same party. So it's kind of similar to uh, double jeopardy, but a little different as well. Next, we've got some, some more. We've had a lot of um, Latin phrases. We're going to have some more going for, going forward. De facto, de jure, de novo. So these de facto means in fact or reality. De jure means legitimate. De novo means to hear a trial over again. So those are what those phrases mean if you ever see those in a an opinion because, they again, we're going to see later on that there are Latin phrases used in opinions. Defendant. So in civil proceedings, the party that is responding to a complaint. So you've got the plaintiff and you have a defendant. Now, when you have a trial court decision, when you've got a trial court decision, the plaintiff will be listed first in the citation versus the defendant. And a lot of times, if it's an individual, it'll be the last name. When you're dealing with tax cases, you're going to have the, um, the commissioner of internal revenue as one of the parties. You're going to have the U.S. as one of the parties, depending on which case it is. Okay. When it's a appeals case, you're going to have the appellant versus the appellee in terms of listing the case in the citation. So we're going to talk more about that later on, but it's really important if you're taking my class to know how to cite cases. I'm actually going to ask you questions in the exam to write out a citation. I'll tell you which parties are which. Very important. Okay. Very important. Deposition, an out of court statement of witness under oath. Dictum or dicta, a statement or remark in a court opinion that is not necessary to support the decision. So it's part of the opinion, but it's not necessary making the decision. There's a lot of times where, where courts, they will pose hypotheticals and say, but what if this happened? Well, they don't, they're not answering that because it doesn't, isn't really what happened. There's a case called 
Crane. And there's a famous footnote in Crane that deals with a non-recourse note issue. And the idea is that a case later on named Tufts came and it answered that question. And I have both of those cases in my top 50 tax cases. If you watch that video, which I have that video as well, you'll learn about both of those cases. En banc, so again, we're hearing a lot of Latin. We have two Latin phrases right here. En banc means a decision is heard by a full court instead of a single judge or selected judges and occurs on cases of significant issues. So the trial court, the trial court cases are normally heard by a single judge. When you get to the court of appeals, that's normally heard by three judges. So trial court is a single judge, court of appeals, CA, court of appeals, three judges. But if it's heard on bonk, the trial, the, the tax court, the district courts, the US federal uh, US court of claims, all those courts could be heard on bonk by the entire court. It's not that common, but it does happen. Tax court it does happen a little bit more, more so than the other courts. If it's something very important, very unique tax issue, very important. The court of appeals, it can also hear cases on bonk. It's heard by all the different judges. And we'll see an opinion later on where the appeals level was heard on bonk. And then if it goes to Supreme Court, the decisions are almost always heard by the full nine justices unless one of them recuses or maybe they're ill or something like that. And join, commander, and struck with authority. Nolo contendere means no contest. Non obstante veredicto, notwithstanding the verdict, a judgment that reverses the jury's determination. Parole evidence, the doctrine that renders any evidence of prior understanding the parties to a contract invalid if it contradicts terms. Per curiam is an opinion from the court expressing the decision but not identifying an author of the decision. Petitioner and plaintiff. So this is the party that brings a lawsuit. The petitioner in a tax a tax trial court level, if it's, if it's a tax court, we call them a petitioner. If it's the... If it's the uh, federal district, federal district court, or the federal court of claims, so I'll just put the federal claims, then it's called the plaintiff. It's the party who initially brings the lawsuit. So it's going to be the, the taxpayer in those, those, those cases. It's going to be the taxpayer for us since we're dealing with tax cases. All right, last, last slide of common legal terminology, and we're going to move on to look at the different courts. Prima facie. Prima facie, that's how you pronounce that, is at face value. So a lot of evidentiary issues deal with prima facie evidence. That's where you find that, at face value. Per se means to represent uh, oneself. That should be, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> Caught myself right there. That's pro se. That's not per se. Per se is different. Per se is uh, a little different. It's pro se. So it's P-R-O se. Easy um, miss right there on my part. I apologize, but it's pro se to represent oneself. Remand means you send back to the lower court. So sometimes the appellate courts, they rule, but then they say, oh, I remand it. We remand the decision of the final outcome, final uh, determination to the lower court to determine. Res judicata is the legal rule barring relitigation on same set of facts. Respondent is similar to defendant and always the IRS in a tax court case. So remember the petitioner in a tax court case is the taxpayer. Respondent is the IRS. That's, that's the main thing. Slip opinion is an individual court decision published separately shortly after the decision is rendered. Summary judgment is a court ruling that no factual issues remain to be tried. Therefore, the cause of action can be decided without trial. And finally, the last one, vacate a reversal or abandonment of a court's prior decision. Woo, went through a lot there. I know it's a lot of uh, common legal terminology, but very, very important elements. All right, so now we're gonna go through the different trial courts, then the Court of Appeals, and then the US Supreme Court. And then we're gonna finish off with a few slides. And then my favorite part is we're actually gonna go through and read some opinions, some tax court opinions, the same issue, the same cases. We're going to start at the trial court level, then go to the court of appeals, and we're going to see the U.S. Supreme Court. And then finally, we're going to conclude the presentation by briefing that Supreme Court case. And I'll show you how to write a brief. We'll actually write it together. So let's talk about the U.S. tax court, which is, again, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about the trial courts. So the trial courts of tax, of federal tax, there's three there's three of them. 
The first one is the U.S. tax court, and it's the most common of the three. And the reason why, there's mo there's multiple reasons, and we're actually going to see a slide after we finish up talking about the trial courts. There's multiple reasons why the U.S. tax court is the main one, but the biggest is that you do not have to pay to play. So remember, the other courts that we mentioned, the federal district and the Federal Court of Claims, U.S. Federal Court of Claims, you have to pay to play. You have to, you have to pay the deficiency and sue for refund. Not the case with U.S. tax court. Makes it very common to go to U.S. tax court. By common, I mean of all of the court decisions that actually go to court. So jurisdiction, it only hears federal tax cases. It doesn't hear anything outside of federal tax. It doesn't hear other issues in the federal code. It doesn't hear patent issues like the Federal uh, Court of Claims does. So it has to be a federal tax case must petition within 90 days after the IRS mails a notice demand for payment of deficiency. That's known as the 90 day letter. So remember I, I mentioned earlier, we have a taxpayer, they filed their tax return by the extended deadline, October 13th, October 15th was the deadline, so they're good there. A few years later, they hear from the IRS deficiency, they try going to appeals, that didn't work, the appeals for the IRS, they try settling, doesn't work. So then the IRS, they send them this letter and then once that 90 day period is up, they then get the petition within that 90 days for, to go to tax court within that, to get, to go, once they get that 90 day letter, they can then petition to go to tax court. So that 90 day letter is what we call it. Very, very important aspect of going to, to uh, court. Tax court is not available for assessed tax issues such as employment taxes. And the reason why is because employment taxes, you pay ahead of time. So you'd be suing for a refund. So it'd be one of the other trial courts. So when you think about, oh, why would, why did a decision go to, or why did a case go to trial court? There's multiple reasons, but it might be that the taxpayer had to pay. Again, the biggest reason why people go to U.S. tax court is they don't have to pay to play. You don't have to front the money. So there's 19 judges that are um, U.S. tax court, regular judges, and they're tax specialists. And by the way, this number might change in the future. So don't rely on this. Um, Again, this video is meant to give you an idea of the system. These ideas will continue to be the same going into the future, but they might add more judges. Who knows, our, our population might grow and they might need more judges to hear more cases. So that's the idea, because you're gonna learn in a moment that they, they're gonna ride around the US. So 19 judges that are tax specialists, a lot of them, they've, they've ta litigated tax cases, they've worked at accounting firms, at law firms, they've, they've been tax practitioners themselves. They're not just people that didn't do tax and then, they go into tax, no, they've been doing tax for many, many years. So 19 judges, tax specialists appointed by the president. So they're appointed by the US president and uh, they're confirmed by Senate. The cases are usually heard by one judge. And by the way, they, they have 15 year terms that can be potentially renewed. So 15 year terms and they can be renewed. So there is a chief judge of the tax court um, the chief judge may have a case reviewed by other tax court judges before release and important cases are heard on bonk by all the judges. So a chief judge can have a certain multi, a certain number of the judges hear the case or it can be all 19 and that would be on bonk. If there's a case that's on bonk, it's more, it's, it's, it's heavier weight by all the judges, all the tax court judges. Now, this is very important. There's no jury trial available when it comes to U.S. tax court. There's no jury trial available. Another thing I want to mention, and I said this earlier, is that there are lots of taxpayers that go to the U.S. tax court pro se, which means no attorney represents them. No attorney represents them. They go and they represent themselves because they want to save on the money. They want to save on that. Now, the U.S. tax court is based in Washington, D.C. However, it travels around the U.S. And I'm going to show you a map of where the major cities it goes to, but it's the big ones like you think. New York, Chicago, D.C. Well, it's based in D.C. Uh, Miami, Atlanta, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Denver, of course. There's going to be even some cities you're going to be like, I can't believe that's on there, okay? So the taxpayer need not pay disputed amount before trial. I mentioned that earlier. So that's why, that's probably the biggest advantage. I would say that is the main reason. So if you are asked on an exam, what's the main reason why a taxpayer might pick the U.S. tax court over other cases, this is the main one. This is the main reason why most, most taxpayers go to the U.S. tax court. I have some other, on a slide, I have some other reasons why, and, they, and there's some of the things I already talked about. The tax court judges are specialists in tax law, so that might make a difference. Um, 
It could be a function of being going pro se. It could also be the small, the small claims division. That's also important because the federal district and the federal court claims don't have that. Tax court can examine an entire return. And it's not limited to the issues raised by a court by the IRS on audit. This is a, um, a disadvantage. So let's say that the IRS, it raises an issue. It raises an issue and it says, okay, you owe us $1,000 taxpayer because you mis misreported this amount or you incorrectly reported this amount and it's all like one respective issue. If the taxpayer goes to tax court, the whole entire tax return, all issues on the tax return are subject to litigation. How often does that happen? Not that often, but it does happen. Additional issues might occur where the tax court says, hey, well, you did this as, you did this wrong as well, so we're going to bring that as well, and we're going to bring additional deficiency against you. So that's the idea. Now, there's really three different types of decisions that the tax court issues. There's two from the regular, the regular hearings. The regular hearings, there's two types of decisions. There's the regular decision, which is about 30 to 35 per year, and they are the ones that you'll see a TC in the official citation. We'll sh I'll show you those the um, later, the uh, citations, because if you're taking my tax research class, taking another faculty's tax research class, it's very important you know how to cite cases. You need to learn it to the point that you can write them out yourselves if you're given the information. And I focus on the official reporters when I ask questions, just for those students out there. But you might have even more difficult teachers that make you know all the different types, the official and unofficial. So regular decisions, there's about 30 to 35, and that's where you see the TC. You don't really see them that often in tax research. You occasionally see them, but you deal a lot more with the TC memos. So the memorandum decisions, those are the TC memos. And these are 250 to 350. 50 cases per year, and they apply existing law or interpretation of facts. So maybe there's an area of law that's pretty well established, but it's an interesting set of facts. That's where you see that versus the regular decisions is a new or unusual point of law, something that really the court hasn't encountered yet. Now, rule 155 says of the um, tax court rules, when a decision is reached without tax court calculating the tax. So the idea there is the tax court, it determines the tax consequences, but doesn't actually calculate the tax liability. That's obviously the IRS comes back and they and they provide that for you. That's the idea there. Now, the third type of decision, I'm going to show you that in a moment. But so this is this, this is type one and type two. The third type comes from the small division, which we're going to see on the next slide. So here's the small claims division. We'll come back to the Golston rule in a moment. But the small claims uh, division, we have a summary opinion. Here it is right here. Summary opinion. I was about to write it out. And the summary opinion is the third type. I just want to um, highlight that before, before we move on. So you know, Hey, where the, he said there's three, where's the three. And this is the second, um, types of cases is a small division, second type. So these are two separate divisions. These are two separate divisions, and I'll explain. Let me explain the Golson rule. Now, this is part of the top 40 tax doctrines video I have as well. Very, very important. The idea is that the U.S. tax court, it's applying federal tax law across the entire country. We've got different, we've got 19 judges. There's actually more than 19 judges because you're going to learn that the chief judge can appoint um, what we call magistrate judges. And these magistrate judges, they are the main ones in the in the uh, small claims division. They're basically, they're not, they're not appointed by the president, but they're appointed by a chief judge to help the caseload. And they focus on the small claims division. So as magistrate judge, they don't have the same, they have, they don't have the same authority, but they do have authority. They basically have the authority through the chief judge. The chief judge has to basically sign off on everything the magistrate judges do. And the idea is that the small claims, they, the magistrate judge, that's where they focus that you can have a small claims division with regular judges as well, but it's almost all the magistrate judges. Okay. And those are appointed by the chief judge. So the Golson rule, basically the idea is while we have all these cases being heard around the country, we've got 19 judges and the magistrate judges, and they're all hearing the cases. It's, they, they have to take into account other tax court decisions. So if they are ruling on a case, remember they're bound the idea of stare decisis, stand on your press, stand on your decisions, stand by your decisions, stand by your past decisions, precedent. They are bound by other U.S. tax court cases. The problem, though, is that remember, we've got the Supreme Court, SCOTUS, 
And then below Supreme Court is the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, CA. And then, then we have the trial courts, which is where the tax court is. So the idea is the trial court, which here we're talking about the tax court, the tax court is bound by other tax court decisions, but also bound by the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals decisions and SCOTUS. The problem is when you're looking at the U.S. Court of Appeals in the federal area, it's geographically bound. So you have to look to the geographic circuit. And that's what the Golston rule basically says. It says that if there's conflict, conflicting precedents in circuit courts. So if you're in, let's say, Florida, which is the 11th circuit, and one tax case, same set of facts is heard in Florida, and a judge, let's say Judge Smith, hears the case in Florida and rules in favor of the taxpayer, but then hears another case in California, and let's say Judge Smith again rules in the case, and let's say that the 11th Circuit and 9th Circuit, because the 9th Circuit is so weird, has they have different uh, applications of the law, different ways that they've applied the law in that respective thing. It's possible that, again, Judge Smith on the same facts in the 11th Circuit in Florida ruled that for the taxpayer, but in the 9th Circuit might rule for the government. It's possible. It's very, very much possible. Okay? Very, very much possible. And that's the idea of the Golson Rule because you're bound by the U.S. US Circuit Court of Appeals that you would appeal to, that that, 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 um, that taxpayer would appeal to. So that one. And if you're, in a, in your, if you're in Florida, you're appealing to the 11th Circuit, not the 9th Circuit. That's the idea. Now, everybody's bound by SCOTUS. Again, all courts in the U.S., state, federal, they're all bound by SCOTUS. It's the highest court of the land. Supreme Court of the United States is SCOTUS. But again, the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, you're bound by your circuit, your specific circuit, and that's why you can have differences. So if there's conflicting precedents in the circuit courts, the judge is required to follow the precedent in a taxpayer's jurisdiction. If the circuit in a taxpayer's jurisdiction has not previously ruled on a matter, the tax court decides cases with its own interpretation. So it looks to other tax court cases just around the country. It can be it's it can be Judge Smith is looking at other Judge Smith decisions. It can be Judge Smith is looking at Judge Brown, who's also a tax court, or Judge Adams, who's a previous tax court judge that's ruled, as long as the cases haven't been overruled or distinguished or whatnot. That's the idea of the Golson rule. Because when you get to that U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals level, it can be considered precedent if you're in within that circuit. Okay, small claims division. So small claims division, again, we talked about these are mostly magistrate judges, can be regular judges, but mostly magistrate judges, and they hear uh, smaller claims. The And these magistrate judges are appointed by the chief judge. The disputed deficiency is up to a certain dollar amount. And both of these dollars, again, I mentioned earlier slide, I don't have some of these items I left out because in the future it changes and I want to make you look it up. At the time of, the vi of this video, and again, look this up, you can stop the video and look it up, it's $50,000 for both of these. So disputed deficiency up to $50,000, including penalties, or collection cases up to $15,000, including penalties and interest. So if you are up to that amount, you can go in the small claims division. If it's, um, if it's beyond $50,000 for these amounts, for, you know, if you're looking at collection versus deficiency, then you have to go to regular. Now, what's there's there's benefits and there's trade-offs. As I mentioned earlier, they the taxpayers a lot of times appear pro se. The small claims I have down here may appear pro se, but I've seen um, that's where the pro se comes into place. So I mentioned earlier the U.S. Tax Court you can have pro se. It's here. It's in the small claims. If it's the regular tax case, you have to have a you have to have an attorney. You have to have an attorney. But if it's a small claims, you can appear pro se without an attorney. Why? It's more informal and we're dealing with a smaller, a smaller amounts. Now that's, that's, you know, okay, well, that doesn't that beneficial. The one trade-off is that it, you cannot appeal. So if you go through the small claims, the decision is final. There's no appeal, no appeal allowed, no appeal allowed. So the benefits of the small claims, if you qualify, right, if you're within that dollar amount, up to 50,000 or less. That number is going to change in the future, right? It's going to go get bigger. More informal proceedings, which is important because uh, the federal rules of evidence are very tricky and they can be, you know, they can limit what you can say in court or what you can bring to court versus here, it's not as, as formal. You can appear pro se, so you don't have to hire an attorney and pay thousands of dollars. The decisions of the small claim division, they're known as summary opinions and they, you can find them 
indifferent. They're not actually um, published. They're not officially published, but you can find them in the different in the different databases, the different um, databases that you pay for online, like CCH, Checkpoint, Westlaw, Lexis. And they're not precedent for other taxpayers, but they are persuasive because they can show how a tax court might rule in a similar situation. So kind of like a private letter ruling. Okay. Appeals from the tax court are made to one of the 12 U.S. Circuit Courts of Appeal based on the ge geographic location in which the taxpayer resides. That should actually be um, the 12 geographic. Yes, that's right. So this is something that students and new tax professionals always confuse. There are 13 federal circuit, there's 13 circuit court appeals, 13 CAs. There's 12 geographic and there's one that we call the federal, for the federal circuit. The federal circuit, the only ones that go to the federal, that, that get appealed to the federal circuit are from the, the court of federal claims. So that's why it's saying that there's only 12 possible cases and they are where the geographic areas are. There's, at the time of this video, and this might change in the future, there's circuit courts first through the 11th circuit and then there's also the D.C., so DC has its own circuit as well. So in, within the District of Columbia, they have their own circuit as well. And then again, the 13th circuit is the federal circuit. And the idea there is that that's only the core federal claims. So I'll mention when we get to that, that um, discussion of the core federal claims. Appeals from the tax court are made to one of 12 U.S. Circuit Court appeals based on the geographic location in which the taxpayer resides. So it's where they reside. It's where they reside. So... What are some advantages to a taxpayer in choosing to initiate its case in tax court? And again, after we finish talking about the three trial court level tax court um, where, where you can start your tax case, we'll, we'll, we'll compare and contrast. But one thing is, the, is here are some advantages. So first, the, ma the main one is a deficiency need not be paid up front. And that's very much different than the other two where you have to pay it and then you have to pay to play, sue for a refund. Next, the tax court is a court of limited or special jurisdiction. The judges are experts in the tax law and hear only tax cases. Thus, if the taxpayer's case revolves around the complex or technical provisions of the tax law and he has sound arguments, tax court may be the best choice. Another advantage is that, remember, for the lower, we have this smaller division. So that smaller division can create benefits. And I would say the biggest one from the small division is you can appear pro se in the small division, but you are giving up your right to appeal in that aspect. Okay. So within the tax court, there's also the ability, if you fall within that dollar amount to pick whether you want regular or small and you get the option. It's not, you're required to go to small. You can hear, get, you can have a regular court decision. So pro se is in the small division. That's the only place you're going to see that all the other courts, you're going to, you're going to have to have an attorney represent you because you're practicing in front of the court. You're practicing in front of that. All right. By the way, there are CPAs and enrolled agents that can appear before the tax court, but you have to fall, you have to, it's very, very rare. There's a test you have to take. It's very difficult. It's a very low pass rate. So I do say there, you have to be an attorney. In the tax court, you can be a CPA or an enrolled agent as long as you have that ability to practice before the IRS in those decisions. And I actually know some CPAs that have gone before a tax court, not many, but again, you have to go through that test. When you're dealing with the federal district court and the federal court of claims, you must you must be an attorney. You, you must be an attorney in, with respect to um, in that jurisdiction. So if you're in a Florida, you have to be a, a licensed in Florida if you're being heard in, I don't know, the Southern District of Florida. That's the idea. Again, we'll talk about more of the, the differences in the, in the trial courts later on, but I just wanted to highlight those. So here is, here, here's the locations. Any, any place you see a little triangle, that's where they have small, small uh, court. And then they have the big cities, which by the way, also, you can hear small small cases are heard in the big cities as well. And you'll, you'll see, again, most of the big cities, you'll see some states have as many as five, five cities, which that's quite a bit. Like uh, Texas has five, right? It has a lot of ge big geographic areas, so that makes sense. One thing I want to mention, when it comes to tax court, again, You've got the IRS, you've got taxpayers. The IRS almost always wins. I'm not trying to say the IRS will win, but the, if you go and you look at, just go online and do research and, and you know search how many times does the, does the IRS win in tax cases, you'll find that they win most cases. So 
there's just that history out there, but that's not to say that, oh, if you have a specific case, you're going to lose. The reason is because again, the IRS, if they know they have, they, if they know if they have a good claim, they won't settle as easy as they would for something they know they don't have a good claim. They're, they're very sharp when it comes to, um, their, their, uh, application, but there will be many times where, where the IRS loses. It happens, it happens quite a bit, but more so the IRS wins. So the last thing with respect to the tax court, and this is extremely important. Again, if you're taking my class, you're taking another tax fact, you know, another class, another tax research class, you're a professional just starting out in the tax area is about citations. I'm going to teach you the citations for all the different, these levels, these courts, I'm going to give you the official and unofficial. If you're taking my class, the official is the one that you need to focus on. If I ask any questions on the exam, it's going to be about the official. It's going to be about the official. So I give you two of the tax court, the regular, these are the regular decisions. So these are the regular decisions. That's the first thing you want to note on this slide if you're taking notes. These are the regular tax court decisions. Remember there was only 30 to 35 per year, the regular tax court decisions, the regular TC. So the temporary citation just means that it hasn't yet been published. And you can read that one. And just basically you see that there's a blank left open the Foster versus commissioner case 138. That's the volume number. The blank is okay. The TC is the official tax court reporter. It's blank because it's not yet been published. And then number four is the case. Let's look at the permanent citation. Just go through that. Very important. So let's first start with the parties. So Foster versus commissioner. So in, in a tax court case, you're always going up against the IRS. You're always going against the IRS. So Foster here is the last name of the petitioner, of the taxpayer. So Foster equals the taxpayer, specifically the, the last name of the, of the petitioner taxpayer. Commissioner is the abbreviation for the IRS and the IRS is always the respondent. So they always call, come second. Now, sometimes you'll see citations. They just, they just leave out commissioner. They just leave it out like that. And technically that's correct. But if you're asked on an exam to do a citation with commissioner, make sure you do that. And you want to follow the abbreviation. Notice there's no period there. There's no period. So it is possible just to have the last name. You'll have like Foster comma James and you'll have the, uh, the reference or you'll just have the last name Foster versus commissioner. And then you have the reference. Let's go through the, the actual number citation. So the 138 is the volume of the tax court reporter. It's a volume number. TC, TC. That should be T dot C. Sorry, there shouldn't be, this, this, there should not be a space here. This is correct. So that's correct. There's no, there's no space. There's no space there. It's this. TC is the abbreviation for tax court reporter. So you need to know that. If you're in my class, you need to know you put TC, T dot C. And it's important you put the dot. Notice that commissioner was an abbreviation, but we don't put a dot there. We put the little dash, but no dot. Sometimes abbreviations have dots. Sometimes it doesn't. Commissioner does not have a dot. The page 51. And by the way, you might be thinking I'm a stickler. Trust me. If you ever have to submit a brief to a judge, and some of you eventually, and maybe a few of you in your careers will do this. Maybe you'll go to law school. It, this type of stuff makes a huge difference. It makes a huge difference. The judges are sticklers. So I'm teaching you to be ready, right? Be prepared for everything. The 51. So we did the, we did the foster versus commissioner. We did the 138. We did the TC. 51 is the page number. And then 2012 is the year of decision. And that's it. That's the official citation. So if I was to say the respondent, I'm sorry. If I just told you that the taxpayer's name is James and it's a tax court case. It's a, it's a, um, it's a regular tax court decision. And I tell you the volume number is 150 and it's on page 418 and it was heard in 2018. Then you could write all that out. You would put, you put James versus commissioner. And let's say I, I told you to do the abbreviation for the commissioner use abbreviation for commissioner and also put that in your citation comma. Then you would do the, um, it'd be, uh, I told you 150 was the volume TC. You put T dot C no spaces like that. Then 51 
Now you put a space. Um, it's going to be, let's just say it was, I don't remember what page I told you. Let's say it's 481. 481, it was decided in 2018. You just do that. By the way, I'm making that up. Don't, don't go there and then you're not going to find that. That's 2018. So you would have 2018 there. And that will be the citation. So if you're taking my class, you might have a question like that. All right, let's continue on. So here are the, the here is the official. So I'm going to have the unofficial citations for you for everything. I'm going to skip over those because I focus on the official, but you can always come back to, you can always stop the slide and, and take note of the unofficial ones, like the permanent Thomas Reuters and permanent CCH. But I'm just focusing on the official for the rest of our presentation. So the official TC memo, tax court decision memorandum. Remember, memo, memo decisions, they are binding, but remember, they're not as strong as the regular tax court decisions. So you have the taxpayer's name, Michael Dixon, then you have TC memo, just like that, and then you're going to be given the year and the decision number, and you put it like that. So if I told you uh, James Smith, and the year of the decision was 2018, and it was decision number 78, you would put taxpayer's last name first, so Smith, comma, James, you put TC memo. I told you it's a, um, a TC memorandum decision. And then you would put 2018 for the year. And then what I tell you, I don't know, 75. <laughs> well, let's, say, let's just say it's 75 for the decision number. And that's how you would do the, the citation. You can ignore the permanent and Tom, Thomson Reuters and permanent CCH if you're in my class. But if you are doing research and you're published, you, you, you're going to be able to find the official um the official, unless it's maybe a, a newer case or something, but almost always in tax, you can find the official, the official decision at some point. Okay, now we're moving on to the district courts. So district courts, we're talking about the U.S. federal district courts. This is the second most common of the trial courts. So the U.S. federal district courts, second. This is our first refund court. So pay to play. So you pay the tax efficiency, the taxpayer pays it, and they are suing. So pay to play, pay to play. Now here, the taxpayer is the plaintiff. And by the way, in a law school, we use pi at, to denote plaintiff or p. So p for plaintiff. And then we use the Greek delta or d for defendant, okay? So defendant in district court for a tax case is always US. So it's always going to be in the, for a federal district court case, it's a tax case, it's going to be blank V US. And it's going to be the taxpayer's last name or the company name, whatever, it's doing the US. So jurisdiction, it adheres cases based on the entire US code, not just the internal revenue code. So that could be a drawback or it could be a good thing, usually a drawback, but it could be a good thing depending on what the issue is. It might be something that the, the, the judge is not very well versed, a very specialized issue, and you want them to not be so versed. The idea here is that the entire U.S. Code, we've got criminal law, we've got uh, contract, or we've got so many different areas of, you've got patent law, you've got all these different federal laws. Uh, contracts, by the way, end up a lot of times being state issues. I mentioned contract, unless it's like a federal contract issue. The idea is that the entire U.S. Code, bankruptcy, all these things are, can be heard by the U.S. federal district courts, not just tax. So these judges are generalists. Cases are, are heard before one judge. Uh, jury trial is available. Jury trial is available. That is the biggest difference. This is the only one of the three courts that has jury trial. So this could be a big advantage. Can you stop and think of a tax issue where maybe, maybe having a jury might be beneficial to your taxpayer? All right, did you think of one? What about like a sympathetic issue? Think about a taxpayer that maybe they're down on their luck. They, they've been assessed tax penalties or maybe, you know, you're dealing with back taxes, something where this taxpayer is just, maybe at one point they were, they were, doing, they were well off. Maybe they had a few really bad years. They have some alcohol problems. Maybe they just can't pay their taxes. And, 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 and you know, the, the attorney on the other, on the, representing the, the, uh, the taxpayer as well as the taxpayer, they're playing up the sympathy card and trying to get the jury to, to, to go on their side, to go on their side. That might be an, uh, an area where it was sympathy. Um, child, child support issues or um, 
alimony issues, things like that, more dependency issues, right? Claiming the earned income tax credit, things like that. Um, but if it's like a wealthy taxpayer, probably not going to be good to have a jury because tax, taxpayers tend to, um, you know, if you're dealing with a super wealthy person, might not be able to empathize your situation. Numerous geographical districts located throughout the U.S. based on population. So depending on the state, some states just have one geographical district. Other states have multiple ones. Like I'm in the state of Florida and we've got the Northern District of Florida. We've got the Middle District of Florida, the Southern District of Florida. So we've got multiple, we've got multiple districts in Florida. Some states, again, just have one district. Other states have a lot more than just three. They have a lot of districts, like in California, all right? It's really based on population, whether you have more. California, Pence, um, sorry, uh, Texas, California, Texas, those are, they have a lot of geographical districts. Taxpayer must pay deficiency before trial and then sue for refund. So again, you're, the taxpayer has already paid the deficiency and is now suing. District courts are general and do not specialize in tax matters. So remember the U.S. tax court judges, they focus on tax law. They know the tax law, the tax code very well. Therefore, decisions can vary significantly among the districts. Therefore, the researcher must examine decisions carefully to assess their probable as use, sorry, probable use as a precedent in a client's case. So let's talk about locating and citing district court decisions, specifically district court decisions. And like other types of decisions, in my class, so if you're my if you're my students, I focused on the official reporters, and that's what we're going to focus on here in this in this slide. So district court tax decisions are published in three different reporters, and they're the official reporters are found here below. You can also find them here, and these are the unofficial reporters. So those are the second and third, but the official ones you're going to find here in this portion. So just keep that in mind. So West Publishing, actually published by West, they publish the Federal Supplement Series. And that's FSUP, FSUP second, just like that, with no dot after the D, and FSUP third. That's exactly the citation where you see in the quotation marks. That's the exact citation. So as you can see, they're, they're based on um, when the cases took place. Of course, as we go more into the future, more and more uh, litigation is occurring. So these reporters are filling up. So it's likely in the future, we're going to have F sup 4D and 5D and so on down the line. That's the idea. It's filling these up. The, the cases are filling these up. Um, I didn't put a date on the F sub third because the time is video. It wasn't limited, but it will be limited in the future and it'll go to another, another volume. So just keep that in mind. Um, that's why I have in the future, there will be more federal supplements as these are finite in size. As you can see with the first edition, this is the first edition right here. And then you have the second edition and you have the third edition, right? First, second, third. And again, it's going to continue on into the future. Now, most law school, university libraries subscribe to the Federal Supplement Series. So if you're trying to do research on a dime you could, and, you're, and you have access to a, uh, a law library near you, whether it's a public university or private, because even some private universities allow public access to um, their, their law libraries, not all, but some of them do, you, you can actually go there. And this is something that, that most law school uh, libraries and even university libraries, they'll have access to these reporters just because they're so, again, they're the official reporter. The I, One thing I will say, one caveat is as we go more and more into the future, law libraries, university libraries, they are becoming more and more online and they're taking their space in, in they're taking the space and they're turning it into more study areas and, and uh, computer and technology areas and, and classroom space for, for the university. So just keep that in mind that, you know, that might be more limited in the future. Um, just keep that in mind. Now, again, I mentioned that there's really three different reporters and the official one is the West Publishing Federal Supplement Series. Then we have these unofficial, the AFTR and the USTC. Uh, AFTR is Thomson Reuters. CCHs is USTC, United States Tax Cases. Those are the unofficial rep uh, where you can find the district courts. And those, those AFTR report, um, American Federal Tax Reports and uh, United States Tax Cases, they include more than just the uh, di US district court cases. They have other types of cases in there as well, but you'll find the district court opinion in there. Also, traditionally published uh, primary and secondary court reporters are available, so there's other ones as well, but these are the three main ones out there. So here's what the, uh, the this is an example. Let's say we have the Bohol case. I'm just going to, again, focus on the official, which is the West. So we'd have the 
Plaintiff, which is the taxpayer, last name Bohol, versus US, so it's always gonna be versus US, and that's how you abbreviate. If I told you it's in the um, 602nd volume of the Federal Supplement Second, second edition of the Federal Supplement, that's what I'd say, which that's how you abbreviate on page 187, and it was heard in the district, you put D dot, and then you put DC, okay, DC. So that's how you would cite that. Okay, now we're on our third of the trial courts. Moving along. This is the third of the trial courts, our last of the trial courts. And then again, when we, we conclude with this one, we're gonna compare and contrast the three. I have a slide that goes over that. Very important, very helpful. If you're in my class, you're guaranteed to have some questions on the exam that focus on the differences or similarities. So U.S. Court of Federal Claims. This is a trial court of general jurisdiction, national court created in 1982 by an act of Congress. They had 16 judges. Remember, trial court, um, sorry, tax court at the time of this video had 19, so 16 at the time of this video. Again, the future likely to increase, but 16 at the time of the video. Judges who hear trials throughout the US. The commissioner collects evidence, testimony, and makes findings which are given to a judge who drafts a tentative opinion. The tentative opinion is reviewed by a chief judge. The case may be heard on bonk, which means, again, all 16 judges can hear it. So remember, this is a refund court. Taxpayer has to pay the refund and must be paid in advance of the hearing and the taxpayer sues for the refund. There's no jury trials allowed and the court of claims judges hear all kinds of cases. The main area that they hear is actually patent cases. Very interesting. This was actually created to help with the patent law issue of the federal circuits, of the federal uh, districts, I should say. So patents is the main thing they hear, but they hear cases involving the U.S. government, certain issues, and taxes and patents. Patents is a big one, but they also hear tax cases. Therefore, judges are not just special, or they're not specialists in tax. They're not specialists in tax. They're a little bit more um, specialized than the the federal district, because again, those cases, they hear criminal cases, they hear all sorts of crazy, you know, diverse cases. A little bit here, they're a little bit more specialized. And I would say that patent law is more technical, like tax law is. It's kind of similarities in some aspects. So in that regard, they're not as technical, technically proficient as the tax court judges are, but they're getting, it's getting closer. It's getting closer than the U.S. district. The party of the lawsuit must be the U.S. government. So again, just like we had in the U.S. district courts, the defendant is always going to be v.us. So we're going to have the plaintiff's name, v.us. And I'll show you an example in a moment. So the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, it appeals to always to, this is very important. Remember we had 12 geographic circuits, of course, of appeal, and we had one called the Federal Circuit. The U.S. Court of Federal Claims is the court that appeals to the Federal Circuit. So you're wondering, well, okay, well, there's also this federal circuit. It's not geographic. What goes there? The U.S. Court of Federal Claims appeals there. Also established in 1982. It was established. They were both at the same time. As a national court, the Court of Claims is not bound by decisions of the 12 geographic circuits. So this might be an area where you know that, that the circuit you're in is bound by certain precedent, but the U.S. Court of Federal Claims hasn't ruled on an area they haven't... Um, or the federal circuit has a rule in an area, so they're not bound by, by the circuit you're in because, or, or the federal circuit. So it gives you the ability to kind of game in terms of, we call it um, jurisdiction shopping. You get to shop the jurisdictions for the law. That's the idea. So query, when would it be a good idea for a taxpayer to initiate his lawsuit in the court of federal claims? Answer, and this is exactly what I was saying. Given the generally short lifespan. So at the time of this video, you know, we're only talking about uh, less than 40 years, been around. So less than 40 years versus the district courts and the tax court, they've been around a lot longer. So the idea is that is having this short lifespan, the Court of Federal Claims and its appeals court, the Court of Appeals, which again established in 1982, both at the same time, there might be little tax precedent versus the circuit that you're in might have tax precedent that's against you as a taxpayer. So you could go here and and maybe you're able to jurisdiction shop to maybe get a better result. So if the taxpayer had a relatively newer 
untried tax issue. It may be best to choose the claims court. It might be best to, uh, for the best chance, taxpayer has influenced the trial court with his or her interpretation of the tax law. That's the idea. So really it's getting at, again, if your circuit has something that you feel is unfavorable to you, you can go to here because they're not bound by that. They might look to that circuit or other circuits in making the decision, but they're not bound by it. So the last thing for the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, I want to mention that this is also a, um, a national riding circuit. So it also rides like the U.S. tax court does. It rides around. Not, not exactly the same cities as the U.S. tax court. I mean, there's less judges. There's not the 19 judges like we saw for the U.S. tax court. But a lot of those same cities, it rides around as well. So it's a riding circuit. It rides all around the U.S. It's the main cities, New York, Miami, Atlanta, um, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco, the big ones that you would think. Here, and then the other thing to mention is here's a citation. So before pre-1992, there was a citation, uh, CL dot space CT dot. I'm not gonna test my students on that if you're taking my class, but you might have to cite it for a memo or something if another professor. Um, you do need to know the official citation after this date, which after, um, 1991. So here's an example. We do the last, it's very similar to the federal district court case citation. We have the last name of the taxpayer, Esposito versus US. You're always gonna have that VUS. Then what you do is the reporter is the, the official reporter is the FED dot space CL dot and then you're gonna have the volume number of the federal claims reporter, and you're gonna have the page number. So very similar, and you have the year. Very, very similar. So here is something I really wanna spend time on, and I definitely recommend you stop the video, write this down, take notes, it's extremely important. It's comparing and contrasting the differences. So we have the tax court here, district court, and the court of federal claims. These are the trial level tax courts, trial level tax courts. So we have the jurisdiction is the first issue. So the tax court only hears tax cases. District court hears all sorts of cases. It's so diverse. And then court of federal claims hears monetary claims against the US government, patent issues. It deals with tax cases. It deals with contracts where parties are suing the US. You get the idea. So next is judges. Judges of a tax court are tax law specialists, which tend to be, that, that tends to be the benefit of tax court. Let's come back and we'll, we'll, we'll look at the benefits and, and, and negatives in a moment. For the district court, they're generalists. And then court federal claims, again, they're generalists, but they're closer to tax court than the district court. Domain, domain, it's a national court and the judges will travel. The district court, it's limited geographical area, but they won't travel to you, but they're actually closer in your areas than you think they are. They're, they're, so within, for example, if you are in the Southern District of Florida, then there is a Southern District of Florida courthouse, federal district in West Palm Beach. There's one in Fort Lauderdale. There's one in um, in Miami. There's one up in Fort Pierce. But if you're going to the U.S. Tax Court, you can only go down to Miami with respect to that that district. So you have to go all the way down to Miami. You wouldn't be able to hear a uh, tax court doesn't take cases in West Palm Beach. So there are there is more. Um, it's closer if you're looking at geographic distance. The, the, the district court of all of these. And then the court of federal claims is gonna be the most limited. It's a national court, judges travel, but again, it, and it goes to most of the same cities as the US tax court, but it's not as many. Jury trial available. So tax court and the court of federal claims, no. And then district court, yes, if it's a question of fact. It's not a guaranteed thing, it's not a short thing, but if it's a question of fact, it is. And again, if you there's a sympathy, there's a sympathy issue where the taxpayer wants you know, has a sympathetic aspect, like, you know, maybe they were in down times, then it makes sense to try to get a jury, to try to get the jury to, to, to um, rule on your side, your favor. Number of judges that can hear a case, district court's always gonna be one. Earlier in the presentation, I mentioned that the trial courts you can hear on bunk. I misspoke if you took it to be all these. District court only can have one, but the court of federal claims, you can have one to five hearing a case, you can also hear, have on bunk and then tax court, you can have one and then it can be reviewed by a chief judge and then on bunk for certain issues. So that's the idea.
That's the idea. By the way, the five for the federal claims, they refer, they use that as en banc, even though it's 16. They, they take five different judges in here. Small cases division, only available in the tax court. So that's a, an advantage and it's, it's um, an element. But again, there's drawbacks within that element. So there's advantages and disadvantages of the small, small cases. It's not an automatic advantage. Not available in district, not available in core federal claims. Payment of tax. Remember, the only one that you, that you get to sue the deficiency is a tax court. The other two, you pay to play. Precedent court must follow. Supreme court, pertinent circuit court, and then the tax court. District court, Supreme court, pertinent circuit court, and own district court. And then court of federal claims, Supreme court, federal circuit court, and the court of federal claims. So now let's go through each of these. Jurisdiction. When it comes to jurisdiction, there's not really a benefit, I would say, for any of these three things. When you get down to judges, it depends on the issue. It depends on the issue, but for most tax issues, you generally want a judge that is a tax law specialist. They know the area of the law. Most tax law issues, most cases that get heard, they're dealing with, with very complex issues. So usually you want a judge that understands what's going on. You don't want a district court judge that might, I mean, there's a lot of sharp district court judges don't get me wrong, but they don't specialize in tax law like these tax law judges do. They deal with tax tax issues all the time. They know all about ins and outs of tax law. They know all these different things. So I would say it's an advantage for the tax court. Domain, national court, but judges travel, limited geographic area, and then national court, but judges travel. That, that can depend. That I would say it depends because, I mean... Actually, I take it back. I was thinking of uh, precedent. We'll come back to that one that one later on. I would say that the district court is the best because it's going to have the closest location to hear your case. So I would say the district court is that has the biggest benefit. I gave you the example. We saw that. Let's say you're in, again, the Southern District of Florida and you're in West Palm Beach. You could have your case heard in West Palm Beach and the West Palm Beach Federal District Court. They have a courthouse there versus... If you're in the U.S. Tax Court or the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, you'd have to go to Miami, from West Palm Beach to Miami, and you're like, okay, well, that's not that far, but still, you know, there is that ability, especially if it's a multi-day trial and whatnot. Jury trial available? Of course, the benefit here is going to be the district court. If you can get a jury for certain issues, you don't have to, a jury isn't uh, required in the district court, so that's a benefit for the district court there. Number of judges? I would say the number of judges you generally would prefer to have more multiple judges hear your case. So most likely you would probably want the tax because it has the most. Definitely you don't want the, the district court. But I mean, this issue is not that important, not as important. But the more more judges that, you, that can potentially hear your case, the better for you because it gives a different perspective. But it's not as important, this respective issue. The jury trial, that's important, I would say at times, depending on the issue. Domain can make a difference because people don't want to have to travel that far. Um, the judges makes a difference. So I would say that, you know, th this is important. This small case division, yes. So that, I would say it does, I would say yes, it does give a benefit because a lot of cases that do go to tax court, they are smaller in size and amount. So, and there's a big benefit of going, I think at least, to going to the a small case division. It saves, you can go pro se. Again, I don't recommend it. You should have an attorney, but it just makes things a lot easier. The, the evidence is a huge thing. You don't get to appeal your case, but I think it's worth it for a lot of, a lot of different uh, taxpayers. It gives them this independent party to go through. This judge is going to go through your facts and whatnot. So I do think that's a benefit. So I'm going to circle that. Payment of tax. This is the big one. This is the main reason why almost all cases start out in the tax court because Taxpayers don't want to pay first and then play. And then precedent the court must follow depends. You could have favorable precedent in your circuit. You could have favorable precedent here. The big one for the court of claims is it's newer. And we saw in that example. So that would be an example of where, uh, as you saw, where where is the benefit? We don't have really benefit. We have some benefits for the district court, some benefits for the tax court. What about the Court of Federal Claims? It's newer, so it's more likely not to have heard certain issues, but your your circuit might have favorable treatment for you, not unfavorable or no treatment. So I think it depends, but I could see this being a potential benefit because 
it's newer and it's more open. You have more open doors. So potential is here. So that's kind of the benefits and, and whatnot. Not not too many disadvantages. I'd say it's more just about spying the advantages. And a lot of this is situational. It depends on the situation. Okay, let's go ahead now and let's talk about the appellate level courts. So first off, we're going to talk about the Court of Appeals, U.S. Circuit Court, US Circuit Court of Appeals. And we've talked about a lot already, but let's just go in more depth. So it's the first level federal appellate court. So all three of the trial courts, they appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals. The tax court and the U.S. District Court, they appeal, we had a slide on this earlier, to their geographic courts where the taxpayer resides. However, the U.S. Federal Court of Claims, they, that, that court appeals to the Federal Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. That's the only one it could go to. Now, these court of appeals, they consider both tax and non-tax issues. And I will tell you that tax is not that common. It's much more non-tax issues. They only hear cases that involve questions of law. They are not triers of fact like, the tri like they do at the trial court level. The judges are generalists. Each circuit has around 20 judges. It's give or take. Some, ju some circuits have less. Some circuits have more. Like the Ninth Circuit has a lot more than 20. There is, it's usually a three-judge panel, but it can be heard en banc. En banc is possible. We'll see later. The Glenshaw Glass Third Circuit case was en banc. So en banc is possible where the entire court hears it. Jury trial is not available, so it's not a question of fact, so you don't need a jury, and it's not available. Jury trial is not available. So the actions the uh, court may take on appeal, they can affirm the lower court's decision, which is most common. They can reverse it, and then they can remand it. They can instru instruct the court how to apply the law and remand it for further proceedings. Now, when it comes to the, uh, the appellate level, you, you, what you see in, on TV is really trial court, where you see the the parties disputing facts, bringing evidence. The appeals is more of a presentation. You've got um, you've got a certain amount of time. And if you go online, go go on to um, on the web and search for moot court for appeals, and you can see how it's it's much different. It's much like a you have what's called you submit your brief and you have the oral argument. The oral argument you have a set number of time, and basically the parties that come up they present. You know you've got the appellant. Right, you got the appellant versus the appellee. The appellant argues, goes first, then the appellee goes, and then you know they save time for rebuttal, all that stuff. And the idea is that it's very formal process. It's not like what you see on TV where they're like objection and all that. It's more of like a um, a presentation, a presentation of of issues, and then there's lots and lots of questions. Attack the um, the judges. They review the uh, the briefs before they're submitted. They they immediately start asking questions. It's it's sometimes it's very hectic and whatnot. Domain is the court of appeals, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm I'm putting a a blank here for in the future of this changes. There's a map on a later slide, but that could change depending on how the population changes. We might have more circuits in the future. At the time of this video, there are 12 geographic circuits, 12 geographic circuits. And there's also a 13th Circuit Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which again is where the Federal Courts of Claims um, appeals. And again, it hears uh, cases from the Federal Court of Claims. When it comes to tax law, the Circuit Court of Appeals, the, when you're doing research, Usually that's what taxpayers are using in, as, their, as, their, as the highest level of authority. You might have a Supreme Court case that applies, but they apply very rarely and the Supreme Court rarely takes tax cases. It used to take more tax cases back when the tax law was fresher, it was newer, but as time has gone on and they've been taking less and less, they take more constitutional law cases, states with you know states' rights, issues like that. They don't really deal much with the tax issues and the tax issues they do take, take on more constitutional elements like jurisdictional tax issues and state tax issues and whether the state has the right to collect sales tax on, on commerce and things like that. Interstate commerce, the commerce clause, all these things, those are like the types of things they focus on at the, at the constitutional level. They don't really deal with the application of tax law and defining terms there, there have been lots of cases in the top 50 tax cases. Most of the cases I talk about are Supreme Court cases, but that was a long time ago. That was in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. That's where you find most of those cases because the, the, tax, the, the tax law was so new. And as we've gone in time, it's been less and less. So that's what I'm trying to say is, remember that in the US legal system, 
Every taxpayer has the right to one appeal. That doesn't mean that every taxpayer does appeal, but they have the right to one appeal. And the circuit court appeals, they will hear that that case. They won't, I'm sorry, they won't hear it. They will review it and they can either affirm it per curiam just immediately, say, oh, we affirm the lower care and not even say anything, or they can say, hey, we're gonna hear this. And usually they hear it when they, they know that there's a genuine dispute of law, as I mentioned earlier, that needs to be heard because there's been a lot of cases on the area. So the researcher should give primary consideration to prior decisions of the circuit of the taxpayer because of the precedential weight. May feel comfortable going out of the circuit if a taxpayer circuit has not ruled on the issue and there is favorable out of circuit ruling in, in, um, in terms of your taxpayer. Let's talk about citations. So we have the federal supplement, federal supplement second, federal supplement third. We've got the federal reporter when it comes to the court of appeals. So it's referred to as the federal reporter. And we've got the second, we've got the third as well. Um, again, they they go, that, that will be increasing in the future as well. So I'm just going to focus on the official. So let's say we have the, the Hills case. That's the taxpayer. So this citation, U.S., U.S. means that the U.S. was the appellant. So it's always going to be the appellant versus the appellee. The appellant is the party below that lost that's appealing. So appellant versus the appellee. So Hills here is the appellee. Think of it like the defendant, but you're at the appeals. Not the original defendant, but the party that, sorry, take that back. Don't think of it as a defendant because when you think of the defendant, you think of a trial court level decision and that's not true. So appellant is the party that lost the previous one and is appealing. Appellee is the party that won and is responding. So US here is the appellant versus Hills. Hills is the appellee and that'd be the last name of the taxpayer or the company name. And again, we follow a very similar approach. 6 to 18 is the volume. If I told you the third edition of the Federal Reporter would be F.3D, F.2D would be the second. So that's how you that's how you put that. 619 is the page it's on, and then the circuit. So we do seventh circuit like that. That's how we write that. And no comma, just the year. So 2010 is the year. Um, first circuit, you just put the first three. DC circuit is DC circuit for DC and the federal circuit is fed F dot. So we do use um, dots to abbreviate right here, here and here. We use those. So we do use the dots and the words. So we do put those, you put the year. Another way that you can cite is if you put CA dash the circuit. So here's seven comma, and then you put a space in a year. So CA dash seven, so seven circuit, uh, space, comma, space, 2010. That's another way. Make this clear. It should be CA-7. Not a, There's no space here. There's no space. It's space like it's comma, then a space, 2010, like that. So that's how I would, I would write. So you can do either one of those. You could do the seventh circ like that, first circ like that, or you can do the CA-7, 2010 like that. I'm not going to look at the unofficial ones. So here are the geographic boundaries. You see 11. So there's 11 different geographic boundaries. You can stop and pause this. I recommend going online and looking at a map, a color coded map. This is obviously not color coded. You can kind of get a sense from the shade, but it might be a little challenging to see. One thing to note is that the 12th geographic circuit is here. It's DC, DC circuit. And there's also the federal circuit, which is here, but that's the one that is not geographic. So again, we have 12 geographic circuits, one through 11. You can count them, one, two, three, all listed out. California, I'm sorry, <laughs> Alaska and Hawaii are part of the ninth. And that California, when you think of the ninth circuit, you think of California. That, so they're part of that. And then the 12th one, if you don't see it on here, it's not number 12, it's just called the DC circuit. That's geographic. It's only in DC. It's only in uh, DC in that area there. Now you'll notice that the US territories like the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, they're part of various circuits as well. Puerto Rico part of the first, Virgin Islands part of the third. So that's also part of those, those circuits. One other thing I wanna mention before we move on is that citation we saw before the US 
v hills and you can go back to the previous slide if you want to take a look at that by knowing that the u.s is a party you know it cannot be a tax court case it's not tax court why because it would have commissioner in the title so it must have been originated in the federal district or the federal court of claims so make sure you know that if i was to give you a case and say u.s v hills you should know that that did not originate in the u.s tax court because u.s would not be a party at the tax court it'd be commissioner it'd be commissioner versus hills so keep that in mind all right so finally with the big one the u.s supreme court also known as scotus so this is the highest court in the nation highest court in the land created by article 3 of the constitution let's talk about the justices they're appointed for life by the president and they have to be confirmed by senate in order to actually become a justice of the supreme court there's nine justices at the time of this video that might change in the future. All nine justices hear every case. There are some rare exceptions where a judge has to recuse him or herself, or maybe the judge is ill, illness. A lot of these judges are older. They've had uh, distinguished law careers. A lot of them are, have been circuit court judges. They've made their way up from the federal district to the circuit court, and then they've made always Supreme Court. Jury trial is not available. They hear questions of law, so very similar to the idea we talked about with the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. They only hear cases in Washington, D.C. So Supreme Court does not travel. You can only hear Washington, D.C. And there's not many cases they hear each year. There's barely any tax cases. You might be lucky to get one or two tax cases a year. They hear tax cases only when there's conflict among the circuits or it's a tax issue of major importance considering the Constitution and the society as a whole. It's comprised of eight justices and, and one chief justice, so there's nine justices. Now, where courts like the tax court and the U.S. Court of Federal Claims, the chief justice changes over time. The chief justice stays the chief justice until a new one's appointed, until one leaves, and then the new one, and then that one is then appointed. It is possible that a associate justice or a senior justice that's not the chief justice can be elevated by that by that president. But when it's when the chief justice retires or or they leave or they die or they decide to step down from that role that it's not like it's a it's a term of years like with the US tax court. That's what I'm trying to say. So just keep that in mind. Review is discretionary only. So again, trial court, you go to trial court. After trial court, the parties the losing side can appeal. They have the right to appeal. They don't have the right to be heard by the Supreme Court. That's the next level. So you have to request for, re, for, for hearing through the writ of certiorari. And of the nine justices, four justices must vote to hear the case. They must vote to actually hear it. Note that denying cert is not a decision on the merits. It's just saying that they do not feel they should review the case. Not many tax cases are heard by the Supreme Court. And again, it's very important to understand that there's virtually no tax cases heard each year. Recall that the great deference is paid to congressional law and making um, in this arena with respect to tax. That's, that's a very important aspect. So the Supreme Court decisions have the full force of law as long as they're not overruled or a, a, a specific case has been distinguished by another Supreme Court. It's given the full force of law because it's the highest uh, law of the land. In terms of citations, again, I'm only going to focus on the official citation, the GPO citation, and that is the U.S. citator, U.S. citation. So we have the appellant here, the U.S. That means that it cannot be a tax court case. It must be a federal district or a federal court of claims case because it doesn't have commissioner in the name. And they're the appellant. So the U.S. is the appellant. It's the one bringing the appeal versus Home Concrete and Supply LLC. It's the business entity name. 566 is the volume of the U.S. reporter. So U.S. No spaces there. Page 478 in the year heard. Pretty simple citation. That's what you're going to find for the official citation. We finished going through all the different types of courts, the trial courts, the court of appeals, and the Supreme Court. Now we're going to talk about some citators, some uh, briefing and also look at some opinions. So citators are very important in practice. They are used to update the practitioner as to how other courts and authorities have subsequently dealt with the decision of interest. 
So if you look at a case, there's different citators, and in videos where I focus on Checkpoint, CCH, Westlaw, Lexis, I show you where you can find these citators, and they distinct, they show you how cases have been distinguished, overruled, overturned, superseded, whatever it is, that's what they do. Some citators let the practitioner know where other decisions have cited to this case. For example, the CCH citator, or Shepherds, which is um, the the generic term shepherdizing comes from, which is shepherd service is in LexisNexis. Other citators provide some detail as to how the subsequent court authority dealt with a decision of interest, such as following it, overturning it, distinguishing it, or limiting it. Examples of citators include the, the checkpoint RIA citator and the shepherd citator in Lexis. So assessing the authoritative value of decision, how do you know whether a decision is is binding, and how do you know if you have multiple buying authorities, which one's the most important? To what extent may the practitioner rely on a certain decision? So here's some rule of thumbs. There's more, but here are some rule of thumbs. The higher the level of the court, the more authoritative the decision is, or more authority it has. So the idea there is that if it's Supreme Court, that obviously trumps, and it applies your, to your situation, that, that trumps anything else. If it's a court of appeals and it's in your circuit, then then that also is important as well, as long as it applies to your fact pattern. En banc decisions carry more weight than regular decisions. So any case with more than one justice, or more, the more justices that, are, that heard the case, if it rules in favor of that, that in terms of what argument you're making, that carries more weight, or against what you're making, you're trying to find the correct law. Now, if your circuit doesn't have controlling law on your issue, there's certain circuits that carry more weight than others. For example, the second circuit where we find New York, right, lots of business issues in New York, and the ninth circuit, which is a huge circuit, California, they carry more weight than some of the other circuits out there. Now, I will say, though, that you also have to consider the social aspects of politics. If you're looking at a very conservative state, a conservative court, then like you're in, I don't know, Alabama, Mississippi, and you're looking at the Ninth Circuit, that might not be the wisest idea when you're looking at things like California. So that, that's something to also consider as well. Um, you might want to consider maybe looking to, um, so the Eleventh Circuit has Alabama, maybe you want to look towards the Fifth Circuit in Texas. Tax court decisions carry more weight than district court or court of claims decisions. I, that, that is a true statement. They generally do. Tax court um for the reasons that we talked about earlier of why there's, uh, the ben in general, the tax court is, there's just so many more cases that the, that the tax court hears that are tax-driven issues, so they just go through so much more. Tax court regular decisions carry more weight than memorandum decisions. That's, of course, uh, true as well. That's a true statement as well. One thing about cases, reading different opinions, you might be asked to do this. I'm not going to ask my students in tax research to ever draft a, a case brief, but it's important to understand how to brief a case. You might in your tax research class, or you're probably not going to be asked in practice. In law school, it's very important because you're asked to read lots and lots and lots of pages of textbooks that are mostly cases. And you read the cases, and the idea is that you're not going to be able to read all 35 pages of, of a case when you're assigned to read four cases and each one's 35 cases for one class. So the idea is that you write down your notes and having this format, this, this uh, consistent format of a case brief helps. The other thing is that these opinions from these different services like Westlaw, Lexis, CCH, Checkpoint, they also provide head notes, which are explanations to help you. They're, they're editorial explanations to help you understand what's going on in the case, and they also link to things. So the head notes, they present a summary of the case, and I'll show you some examples. They're written and inserted by the court reporter editor. So we're going to look at the checkpoint decision, and you'll see that's formatted in a certain way. And then we'll look at the actual official reporters for the Circuit Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, but you're going to see it's a little different. But even in the Circuit Court of Appeals and the U.S. Supreme Court, you're going to see some head notes as well. Maybe more than one head note per case, depending on how many issues are involved. So you'll see it's numbered, and they'll actually have reference in the case where you can see those numbers. Researcher may construct concise case brief for future reference to an analysis. I'm sorry, for future reference or to reference as analysis for another client. So as I mentioned, case briefs, especially in law school, very important because you're reading during the semester hundreds of cases for a class. And the idea is at the end of the semester, when you take that one exam, you're not going to be able to remember everything. So if you're watching this and you're a law school student, you're like, well, duh, I know that. But those of you that are in law school, you're not familiar, you might not be familiar with this, this case brief. The idea is that let's say we have a 
12-page opinion like we're about to look at. You can put it down, summarize it in just one page, the important elements so that you remember those, those ideas. The And we're actually going to create a case brief together from scratch. The different formatting elements include the citation at first, procedural history, the facts, issues, holding, rules, and analysis sections of the actual case brief. So we'll see that later on. Now we're going to do something fun. I like to do interactive stuff with students. A lot of faculty, a lot of teachers, when they teach these topics, they kind of just say, oh yeah, go forth and, and learn by doing. I like to actually go with you and read and do, and do things with you to, to help guide you. I have how to write a tax memo video, I actually write the memo with you. I've gone through factors tests and I've shown you how to analyze and how to create questions. I love to do things like that with, with the audience and I'm gonna do the same thing. If you've never read a court opinion before, you're gonna notice that they're, they're kind of long and I wanna help guide you as a reader in tax cases to kind of understand what's going on. And we're actually gonna read a series of core opinions. It's gonna be the same case, the Glenshaw Glass Company case. And it's gonna start off with the tax court, then it's gonna appeal up to the US Court of Appeals Third Circuit, and then finally it makes its way up to the US Supreme Court. So let's go through and let's look at these opinions together, starting with the trial court. All right, we've got the Glenshaw Glass Company versus Commissioner. This is the US tax court case. You'll notice there's this key site, red flag. Now I got this from Checkpoint. So different, different citator sources, they have different things. It says severe negative treatment, judgment reversed by the Supreme Court. And we're gonna see that case later on. So that means that this is the original trial court and it's gonna be reversed later on by the Supreme Court. That's what it says. Here's our citation, 18 TC 860. Now you see the, um, the citator services like to have their ways to reference commissioner. Again, the preferred way is to put commissioner C O M M apostrophe R. And I highly recommend doing that in my class as well as um, your faculty classes if you're doing that or in your uh, professional research because that's the official way according to the blue book, the blue book of citation. So that's the citation. The party's names Glenshaw Glass Company versus Commissioner of Internal Revenue. Okay, so it'd be Glenshaw Glass Company versus Commissioner of Internal Revenue. That would be the citation. And you can abbreviate company, which is recommended. Don't have to, but it's recommended. And we'll, I'll show you that citation later on. Case was heard in 1952, so that would be um, that would be when it, it's heard. Again, this citation up here, you're like, well, what about this C CIR versus Glenshaw Glass Company, U.S. March 28, uh, March 28, 1955, that's the U.S. Supreme Court decision. That's when it was heard. So this is in 1952, tax court case, 18 TC 860, 1952 right there. So keep that in mind for our citation. If you're putting your citation and you put that for your um, brief later on. So this synopsis is actually what's provided by, um, it's provided by the court. So the synopsis, it's giving an idea of what's going on where a lump sum of money is received in settlement of various claims, an allocation of specific amounts to each of the several claims is necessary and proper. Two, sums received in settlement of punitive damages do not constitute taxable income. And three, sums received in settlement of claims for anticipated profits are taxable income as ordinary income. So that synopsis is giving a extremely, extremely, extremely high level overview of what happened in this case, um, what of what the, the holding is. I would even say it's even it's even much it's even much higher level than your brief that you're going to write. Okay, and we're going to write that brief at the end for the Supreme Court case um, of Glenshaw Glass. All right, it gives the attorneys and law firms, it gives the names of the parties if you ever need that. If you're my students, that's not really going to be that important in my class. Here's the findings of fact. Now, this is a trial court level. The lower you are, the much more drawn out the facts are going to be. Because remember, when you get to the Circuit Court of Appeals and the U.S. Supreme Court, they are not finders of fact. They focus on the law. They focus on the stipulation of facts found by the trial court, and they summarize those things. Now, I'm going to go ahead and summarize what's going on here. Glenshaw Glass Company is a company that makes glass products like jars and whatnot, and they're located in the Pennsylvania area. They're a Pennsylvania corporation. They've been around since um, 1900 um, as a successor to a limited association from 1895, so actually before 1900. Been around for a long time. They've been dealing with this Howard Automatic Glass Feeder Company and other companies that are referenced, the Hartford Empire Company. And really what's going on in this, in this, in this uh, fact pattern 
Glenshaw Glass, they're suing one of these companies that provides equipment because the equipment was up to standards or they violated the contract and there's an antitrust suit going on. There's an antitrust issue as well. There's um, treble damages, which if you know about treble damages, treble damages, three times, you take um, three times the compensatory damages. So treble damages is an antitrust suit and compensatory damages, what the court believes is to compensate the party for the damage done. You take, you take compensatory damages and you multiply that times three. And the idea is that one third of the treble damages, so these equal treble damages, one third is compensatory comp and two thirds are punitive. And many of you know what punitive damages are. Punitive damages are meant to punish the party. So in a lot of criminal cases, there will be, um, sorry, in a lot of civil cases where there is, I should say, intentional torts, civil, civil cases with intentional torts, where there also is a criminal case as well. So maybe there's a battery case, but then there's also a civil battery case, which is an intentional tort. There will, might be a punitive aspect to the damages, not just the compensatory to reimburse for medical costs or lost wages or lost property or whatever it is. There might be a punitive aspect to punish the party so that we encourage people not to do this in the future. That's the idea. So that's, that's what's going on here. The glass company, Glenshaw Glass, they receive treble damages and they receive other damages as well. They receive, and if you read the facts, I recommend doing that. I'm not going to read them. They're, they're extremely long. I'm very explaining it. They receive a whole host of damages from this party, but the main one that's going to be at issue is the treble damages, the treble damages. Okay. Let's go ahead and continue through the pages. So if you want to read this page, go ahead. We're still dealing with facts, still a facts page. So I'm just going to write facts if it continues on. I've really kind of highlighted the main points. Again, we're continuing with the facts. And they even provide down here kind of a summary. Loss on destruction of fruit business. They've got litigation and travel expenses. So these are all different amounts. Settlement of accounting order. Different, different things that they're seeking. And then here's the punitive damages amount, which they talk about. And again, if you read about it, it talks about the treble damage portion as well. And then here is the actual punitive damage right here, $500,000. Now, actually what the treble damage portion was, if you read the case, was it was 750,000. So 750K was treble, 250 of that is the compensatory loss of the uh, loss on destruction of fruit jar business. And then 750,000, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm doing the whole thing there, my apologies. Get excited. 500,000, right? One third, two thirds. 500,000 is punitive. And that's really going to be the focus of this case. There's going to be other focuses in the case as well, but you're going to see that in the circuit court appeals and the Supreme Court, they only focus on the punitive, the treble and the punitive portion. So that's really what we're going to focus on as well. And they continue with the facts. So many, many pages of facts. And that's what you're going to see in trial court opinions. You're going to have, and it's really important you read through those facts. Again, I summarize what takes probably 30 minutes for you to read and go through, maybe 20 to 30 minutes. I summarized for you in five to 10 minutes. But really, if you really want to get a good understanding of, of what we're doing, I highly recommend stopping the video when I go to each page and reading through the facts or pulling up this case online if you have access to um, one of these databases, either one. It's, real, it's going to really help you understand how to navigate an opinion. But read through those facts. Still dealing with more facts. Still going through facts. Again, punitive portion, talking about that. Okay, so now we're finally getting to the opinion. So the opinion is right here where it says opinion. So we're given the name of the judge. And again, we're at the tax court. Remember, this is a tax court opinion. Citation is right here. So the basic issue before us is the taxability of a sum of money received by the petitioner in 1947 in compromise settlement of several claims. So there was a settlement that took place between Glenshaw Glass and one of these companies in terms of the, the suit and the settlement occurred. Of several claims asserted against Hartford Empire Company, here and after referred to as Hartford. So that's the company that the equipment company that it, it violated rules, it violated contracts and other issues with with um, 
with the Glenshaw Glass. In two suits, there was two two suits, and in subsequent sub, uh, settlement negotiations, the claims were for, and they give you the uh, nine types of damages that resulted. So it, it's, it's giving you a summary. The claims were for reimbursement of the sum paid in settlement of the accounting order. We saw that. Second is reimbursement of litigation travel expenses. Third, reimbursement of loss incurred in dismantling Shaw Key feeders. Fourth, reimbursement of royalties paid to Hartford. Five, fifth, interest on refund of royalties and other reimbursement items. Sixth, loss due to destruction of fruit jar business. Seven, loss due to destruction of various lines of glassware business other than the fruit jar business. Eight, punitive damages under Section 4 of the Clayton Act, which is where you get the antitrust and the treble damage portion. And nine, punitive damage for loss caused by Hartford's fraudulent practices. The taxable income of the sum received in settlement, each of those claims is dependent upon the nature of the claim. So what it's saying, and this case is back in 1952, and the tax law was much different back in 1952 than it was it was today um, at the time of this video. There's a lot of differences, a lot of differences. Main thing being that in 1954, the tax code changed significantly of our second tax code. And that's going to be important because you're going to see reference to code section 22 rather than section 61. So keep that in mind for those of you. For those of you that have watched my previous videos where I say it's important to understand the code sections and the different codes. And then remember, we have our 1986, the third tax code. So we're talking, there's been a big difference. But this, this case, this line of cases is still very important. Okay, so 1986, we have our third tax code. Again, we're in 1952. What it's saying here is basically, depending on the type of damages, depending on the type of damages, uh, changes whether it's going to be included in gross income. Depending on the type of damages equals gross income, whether it's included in gross income or not. And we're going to learn more about this later on. Some of you might already have learned about damages specifically, like what which damages are included in gross income, which are not included, like under Section 104 and one, Section 105 of the Internal Revenue Code. Specifically, Section 104 is the main main code section that deals with damages. But certain damages are not included in gross income, and other ones, like loss of profits, are automatically included. Things like defamation and um, reputation, they, they, they're kind of a little bit trickier. Okay, so that's what's saying there. That is a sum received settlement of claim for a non-taxable item is non-taxable, whereas it would be taxable as ordinary income. So this is where we're getting into the rules, and we'll get more into them in the in the later case in the appeals cases. Is non-taxable, whereas it would be taxable as ordinary income if the item claim was an ordinary income item, or taxable as return of capital, which means not taxed excluded from income if the claim was for recovery of lost capital. So it's saying that, hey, if this is attributable to ordinary income like wages or lost wages, then it's going to be treat then the damages are going to be treated as ordinary ordinary income and taxable. But if it's simply just a return of capital like somebody destroyed your property and that's a return of capital because you've invested in the property, then that would be excluded from from uh, in, from gross income. That's kind of the idea. The parties seem, and they, by the way, they give a bunch of citations. They give a bunch of citations here. The parties seem to be in agreement that the sums received in settlement of the first five claims are taxable as ordinary income. So they're saying, okay, the IRS and Glenshaw Glass, based on how Glenshaw Glass either reported on a tax return or what they did at appeals, these five, the first five, we're going to ignore. We're going to ignore these five because their ordinary income and the taxpayers, there's no dispute. So the ones that are disputed are six through nine. And we're going to see their speci specific emphasis on the later courts on number eight and nine, which deal with, sorry, this should be number eight and nine, which deal with punitive damages. And that's what the Sir Court of Appeals, Third Circuit, and the Supreme Court are going to focus on. Okay. So let's continue on reading. And again, I'm reading. I've gone through this already. You can tell I've gone through this. I've read this opinion before many times. It's one of the top 50 tax cases, so I know it very well. It's very. It's one I teach in my classes, not in, in almost all my tax classes, where Glenshaw Glass, the Supreme Court, we have the three elements of gross income. The idea is that 
you can read all this, stop the video, read, make sure you read, get an idea, but I'm, I know where to, where to focus on. So the respondent has determined that they constitute ordinary income and petitioner has offered no evidence or argument to the contrary. So respondent is the, um, the IRS and the petitioner is the taxpayer. That's always the case for, remember, tax court cases. So again, the court's basically saying that those, those items, there's no dispute, those are included. Those are included. The parties even seem to be in agreement, so we're not even going to talk about that. That's why I crossed those off. So really, six and seven, eight and nine are at focus, and eight and nine are going to be the biggest focus. Once we get through eight and nine, we can pretty much move on to the circle of appeals because I'll just give you the, the overview of what happens. So the first issue is whether the sums received in settlement of the punitive damages, so eight and nine, claims constitute taxable income. It has been long established that punitive damages do not meet the test of taxable income set forth in Eisner v. McCumber, which is a Supreme Court case, 252 U.S. 189, on page 193, as the gain derived from capital, from labor, or from both combined, provided it be understood that include, I'm sorry, include profit gained through a sale or conversion of capital assets. Now, those three asterisks, Stars, whatever you want to call it, means that they've they've left out parts from the phrase or the sentence. So it's just they've taken language from a part of a sentence. They they and they, and they remove part of it as well. Now let me let me stop. The Glenshaw Glass case is one of the most important cases when it comes to defining gross income. Before Glenshaw Glass was decided, the most important case by far was Eisner versus McCumber. And basically, the most important premise of that case was that the gain derived from capital from I'm sorry, the gain derived from capital, from labor, or from both combined, provide it to be understood to in include profit gain through a sale or conversion of capital assets. So what it said is that um, you can have gross income from capital, from labor, or both. That's basically what it did. And the idea is that um, that decision kind of gave a, a little bit under understanding of of what Code Section 22, which is new, which is now Code Section 61 of Congress, just made it very broad. What's included in gross income? but it gave some context that, hey, it's also on capital, it's on labor, those economic principles. Cite some, um, some more decisions. The basic definition has been recently cited with complete approval in Commissioner versus Culberson, our Supreme Court case, right? 337 U.S. 733 on page 740, and has been adhered to by the respondent in his regulations, 111, section 29.2. 22A-1. And the regulations, by the way, the numbers before have changed, but that 22 is code section 22, which used to be, which is the pre, before 1954 tax code, the 1939 tax code version of code section 61. Therefore, on authority of those cases, we follow this rule of longstanding that has never been questioned in any court and hold that the sums received in settlement of the punitive damages do not constitute taxable income. So they just held that the punitive damages, so punitive damages that Glenshaw Glass received are not gross income. And that's how they ended that issue. Now they go through the rest of the case and they go through the other issues. So that was number, that was uh, item eight and nine. They go through item six and seven. They go through item six on six and seven on, on this on the rest of this page, but that's that's the end of where they go. So basically, all they said was, okay, we're bound by U.S. Supreme Court cases. We have Eisner versus McCumber and Eisner versus and, um, the Commissioner versus uh, the Culbertson decision, Culbertson versus Commissioner case. That one continued to use Eisner versus McCumber. That was the most recent Supreme Court case that they had. They basically said, okay, we're continuing with that holding and these this line of cases, the tax court and Culbertson and Eisner versus McCumber, they pretty much hold that nothing about punitive damages and we don't think punitive damages are gross income based on how the courts have held before. That's all they're saying. That's what they've said. And they basically then, therefore, they concluded that punitive damages are not gross income. So on this page, what they do is they, they spend a lot of time going through and apportioning the lump sum settlement of what is considered the um, amount of certain types, what's punitive damages and what's not. They're basically going through and trying to proportion 
because if punitive damages are excluded and and the items one through five are included, then then that would say finally we must determine what portion of the eight hundred thirteen thousand dollars is allocable punitive damages because there, because the court ruled that it's it's not included in gross income. So they go through that and that's really how they end the case is determining that element, and then they conclude um, this decision will be ru- entered under Rule five, fifty and they provide the citation and that's that's how things end. So now we're going to the third circuit. So the IRS lost. They lost on the punitive damage issue. So the IRS lost the punitive damage issue. And that's what they're going to be appealing. So here is the third circuit. This is the Federal Porter second series. This is the Federal Reporter Second Series. And we've got Commissioner of Internal Revenue. So remember, the first party is the appellant. The IRS law, so they're the appellant, versus Glenshaw Glass. Look here. Also below, it has Commissioner of Internal Revenue versus William Goldman Theaters, Inc. Now, these are two cases that are heard together, both in the Third Circuit, both being heard at the same time. This is decided... It was argued in 1953, but decided in 1954. You go by the decided date. The argued date is when the oral arguments took place. Now, the way it works is you submit brief. You submit it weeks ahead of the oral argument. Judges look at the at the brief. Then you do the oral argument. Then you'll get your decision weeks or months later. You'll get the decision weeks or months later. So 1954 is is the year that this decision was, was decided. So you put that in your citation. Now, I will tell you that when you have multiple cases, and this does happen occasionally in tax, like example, Duverstein case, which is uh, another important tax case dealing with gifts, there was actually multiple, there was a Stanton case. There was Stanton and Duberstein. If you don't believe me, go look at the Duberstein Supreme Court case. You'll see that there's a Stanton case that came up before the Supreme Court as well, and they both dealt with gift gift issues. Well, the second, the second case, I should say, this part actually doesn't go in the citation. So the citation that we refer to is going to be commissioner versus the first party. And since Glenshaw Glass comes before William Goldman, it's going to be Glenshaw Glass Company. And then we put the citation. So we, even though it's two cases, it's heard together. So we just put the first. So that if you're ever wondering, that's what happens with that. They just use the first to keep the citation simple. The idea is that you just want the party to be able to look this up. Okay. So first thing you're going to notice is that the facts are going to be extremely limited compared to the original, right? The, the, the trial court original jurisdiction case was really long. It was like six pages of facts. This one, maybe a page or two of facts, if that, and much more focus on the law because it's a question of law that we're focusing on. And then you're also going to see that the opinion itself is much is a lot smaller, a lot smaller. You are going to notice though that when they get into the punitive damages issue, they go in more, much more depth. And again, the questions of law. So that's what they're dealing with. So let's go ahead and start reading. From the decisions of the tax court of the United States, 18 TC 860 and 19 TC 637 in favor of two taxpayers. So the tax court ruled in favor of both taxpayers. So and that's why Commissioner of Internal Revenue is the appellant in both. So here's a citation to both. 18 TC 860 is for Glenshaw Glass. 19 TC 637 is for William Goldman. And again, they're the appellees. They won the, the lower court decision. The commissioner appealed. So the Commissioner of Internal Revenue appealed. The Court of Appeals, Biggs, Chief Judge, held that monies paid to taxpayers as punitive damages are treble damages for violation of the Clayton Act, even though they've paid to one of the taxpayers as a settlement of its suit for punitive damages for fraud and treble damages under the Clayton Act did not constitute income. So this is a synopsis, like we saw earlier, because there there is, this is a West reporter, it's the official reporter, but it's also West, so that West is, they own um, Thomson Reuters West, they own Checkpoint, they own Westlaw, um, for those those search engines. So they do have some editorial aspects. So this is actually the synopsis is what you're reading right now. This is giving you an overview of, of the case. Let's continue on to the next page. So this is still the overview. It's telling you what happened, basically saying that the decision was affirmed at the lower level. So the third court of appeals, this Chief Justice Biggs in the third court, 
and we're going to find it's on bonk. So it's actually all the judges. We're going to find it here before Biggs, Chief Judge, and Morris. So Justice Morris, McLaughlin, Cal, Cal, Calder, sorry, Kalodner, my apologies, Kalodner, Staley, and Hasty. So you're like, okay, well, there's only what? One, two, three, four, five, six judges? Yeah, six judges. Um, well, back then, there was only six judges on the cir Third Circuit. There's a lot more today because population has increased. So the idea is that it's heard en banc. This is an en banc opinion because usually it's three, three judges, right? Because you want you want to make sure you have a um, you have a odd number regularly. But when you all the judges here, you know, you need to have a majority win with regard to that. So what are all these one, two, three, four, five? What are these items? These are what's these are the um, these are the head notes. You'll see a key site, 317, 421. That refers to their internal editorial system on, on specific topics. And you can read all these head notes. Um, for example, number one, internal revenue, neither property nor money received as a return of capital or contribution to capital, nor a single gift of mo money or property as taxable income. That number one is going to actually translate in, in our respective opinion. So this is not... This is not the official opinion. This is not part of the official opinion written by the judge, even though we're dealing with the official reporter. This part right here, it starts right here, or I should say right here actually, that where the judge starts writing is here, but it starts with the parties, who's representing who, who's representing what parties. So we have Biggs, the chief judge, and let's go ahead and read. The commissioner seeks to reverse two decisions of the United States tax court in favor of two taxpayers. In Glenshaw, a claim for punitive damages based on a com competitor's Hartford's fraudulent suits, which disastrously affected the taxpayer's business, as well as a claim for treble damages under Section 4 of the Clayton Act, 15 USCA, Section 15, were settled by payment of a sum of money. And then they talk about the Goldman case. In Goldman, a judgment for treble damages was awarded Goldman against Lowe's Inc., also pursuant to Section 4 of the Clayton Act. So both of these cases deal with treble damages. The sole question presented for our determination is whether the monies paid as punitive or statutory treble damages are taxable as income under Section 22 of the Internal Revenue Code 26 USCA. The tax court has decided that they are not and the Commissioner of Internal Revenue has petitioned the court for review. Insofar as the issue before us is concerned, no valid distinctions can be drawn between a money settlement and money paid in satisfaction of a judgment or between punitive damages levied for fraud and treble damages rendered under the Clayton Act. The positions of the taxpayers are based in large part upon the definition of income set out in Eisner v. McCumber, which again we focused on in the trial court level. On the decision of this court in Central R. Company versus Commissioner, the decision of the Board of Tax Appeals, which by the way, the Board of Tax Appeals is the original, the original tax court, and the applicable treasury regulations, which we referenced in the tax court as well. The taxpayers also assert considerations which are based on general philosophy of income taxation, but we will not discuss these specifically in this opinion. But the United States, for its part, contends that Eisner v. McCumber does not settle the applicable definition of what constitutes taxable income insofar as the cases at bar are concerned that the decision of this court in Central R Company case is not applicable, but if it is, it was strongly decided, sorry, it was wrongly decided and that the decision of the Board of Tax Appeals in Highland Farms was clearly erroneous. So basically, the court's trying to say that, oh, the previous holdings um, need to kind of be, you know, they were wrong in a way. That's what the what the the government is trying to say. When they say United States, they mean the Commissioner of Internal Revenue, the government. By the way, look how long that sentence was. That's typical in these opinions. That happens a lot in the law. The substance of the government's argument is that all property or money coming into the hands of a taxpayer is income, except where specifically exempted by the taxing statute. And you might be saying, yeah. Isn't that right when you learn about gross income? But back in 1952, when they, I'm sorry, 1954, when this case was decided, that wasn't as clear. 
So let's go ahead and continue reading. By the way, I'm skipping over the footnotes. You can read the footnotes. Footnotes almost always are dicta, just so you know, um, but they might be help, helpful in, in, in terms of, of your re research. I try to focus on the actual opinion. In Eisner versus McCumber, the Supreme Court stated, income may be defined as a gain derived from capital, from labor, or from both combined, provided it's understood to include profit gain through a sale or conversion of capital assets. In Eisner versus McCumber, the Supreme Court laid emphasis on the ordinary meaning of income in common parlance and said, for the present purpose, we require only a clear definition of the term income as used in common speech in order to determine its meaning and amendment. Some of you out there are watching this and you're saying, what? They really thought that at one time? Because what you learn is that in tax law, definitions of items are not the same as common, commonly used. Again, there were times where things were a lot different. The second sentence of the applicable treasury regulations adopted the Eisner versus McCumber definition in toto in all. See note seven of the opinion. The only qualification of the second sentence of the regulation lies in the phrase, in general, and surely little can be taken of that. Of course, as the United States, which again is the IRS, points out in Eisner versus McCumber, the Supreme Court was primarily concerned with distinguishing between capital and income, not between sources of property which came into the hands of the taxpayer, and we cannot doubt but that the Supreme Court has departed in some, dis in some degree from the Eisner versus McCumber definition. This is apparent in various cases, Kirby Lumber, um, where just as Holmes stated, we see nothing to be gained by the discussion of judicial definitions. So basically they, they said, okay, well, everyone keeps using the Eisner versus McCumber case, but you can't rely on that always. So here's that number one, and that goes back to that keynote. So remember that keynote, that head note, I should say head note. The, the keynotes were within the head note at the end to reference in the keynote system so you can see other cases that, that are, are similar with respect to that issue. So number one, it ties back to that, that respective keynote if you want to go back and see what that says. If the property or money paid represents a return of capital or a contribution to capital is not subject to income taxation. Okay, well, that's what Eisner reverse McCumber dealt with. Subsidies paid, this is important, we're going to see later on. Subsidies paid by a sovereign to aid it in construction and operation of a railroad line were held not to be income in Edwards versus Cuba Railroad Company, our company. And the money and property acquired were treated as, sorry, treated in effect as an accretion to capital. But compare Detroit Edison Company versus Commissioner, where Supreme Court has indicated some halt in the doctrine of capital donation expressed in Edwards versus Cuba Railroad Company, affirmed and whatnot. A single gift of money or property probably should not be treated as taxable income, even if the specific exemption granted to gifts by statute were unavailable. So many of you know that Code Section 102 provides an exclusion for gifts received in income. They're saying that even if there was no specific exclusion, gifts probably would not, should not be included anyways. Periodicity seems to be considered a factor. And they focus, they, they uh, reference a U.S. Supreme Court case. The spontaneity of the gift may also serve to relieve the recipient of tax. And they, again, reference some Supreme Court cases. The United States lays emphasis on the decision of the Court of Claims in Park and Tilliford Distillers Corp. versus United States. In this case, the issue was whether a recovery under Section 16B of the Securities Exchange Act constituted income to the recovering corporate taxpayer. The Court of Claims held that the ta recovery was taxable as income and specifically rejected the Reasoning of this court in Central Railroad Company versus Commissioner and the decision of Board of Tax Appeals in Highland Farms. So basically, the IRS wants the court to think that the case in front of us, the Glenshaw Glass case, is more similar to Park and Tilifer than it is the Edwards versus Cuba Railroad Company because, well, first, the Park and Tilifer's Distillers Corp, that case, they ultimately ruled that it was taxable income. Uh, that's the main reason they want to get that in there. And second, they think the facts are more similar versus the Edwards versus Cuba. So let's see what the, what the court thinks. It talks about the court of claims held the recovery was taxable as income and specifically rejected the reasoning of this court in Central Railroad. I mentioned that earlier in Highland Farms. The court of claims stated the money tie like this. The court of claims stated the money came in from an outside source. It went into the plain, 
plaintiff's treasury. It did not replace something which went out the plaintiff's ownership as a consideration for it. The court went on to say that it was unwilling to surmise the definition of income of Eisner versus McCumber was sufficient to read out of the taxing statute the phrase income derived from any source whatsoever. Very important. We're going to see that's even more important in the Supreme Court case. In our opinion, so this is where the court is now, they're providing their, their, their why they, whether they think they agree or disagree, whether that, that case applies. In our opinion, the theory of recovery under Section 16B from the that federal claim court that we just mentioned of the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934 is not purely, sorry, is not a purely punitive one. The statute was designed to prohibit profit being made by an insider possessing pe peculiar knowledge of future profitable operations of his corporation. The making of a profit by the insider is the mainspring of the statute, a profit required by law to be passed on the corporation, probably because the corporation is the most convenient recept receptacle. An outsider purchasing stock in the open market, theoretically at least, would be compelled to pay a higher price because an insider was purchasing stock in the market against him. But under the operation of statute, all the stock holders gave only the insider whose operations were prohibited by statute would receive via the corporate entity the profit made by the prohibited transaction. We do not agree with the position of the court of claims that Park and Tilford's recovery was purely a windfall. So basically, this Third Circuit, they are distinguishing. So the Third Circuit, Court of Appeals, they're distinguishing this case that the IRS once thinks is, is the most similar case. This Park and Tilford case. They don't think that this, this case is like that. Let's continue to read what they have to say. In general, American Investors Company versus Commissioner, the tax court followed the Park and Tilford decision of the court claims, but distinguished its decision from that in the instant Glenshaw Glass case and the decisions in Central Railroad and Highlands Farm and joined the definition of taxable income of my Eisner versus McCumber. Judge Murdoch, in his concurring opinion, pointed to the provisions of section, sorry, section 16B of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 bees that any profit realized under the circumstances, let's highlight that, any profit realized under the circumstances presented the general American investor case shall inure to and be recoverable by the issuer, i.e. the corporation. Judge Murdoch took the position that the profits were income to general American investors within the pure uh, purview of section 22a, which is the current section 61 of the intro revenue code, since they were profits either from sales or dealings in the property growing out of the, the ownership of or interest in such property or from any source whatsoever. So again, there, the court is focusing on what was done in the past where tax court distinguished this Park and Tilliford, and they're saying, Hey, we're distinguishing parks and Tilliford because the tax court has done that as well. And the idea here is maybe the Third Circuit doesn't have anything that they can follow, so they're 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 open to looking at other other courts that are persuasive, and it's persuasive here. The facts of Parks and Tilford and the General American's decision are distinguishable. So they're saying both of these from Central Railroad versus Commissioner. So now we're going to number two. The United States condemns that the source of gain should not be controlling in view of the final phrase of Section 22 dealing with the gains or profits or income derived from any source whatsoever. That the phrase last quoted expresses congressional intent. So derived from any source whatsoever. That's what the uh, United States, the, the IRS is arguing. That that phrase last quoted expresses congressional intent that the source of income of gain is immaterial, a complete negation of the concept of source in relation to taxable income. The government in substance asserts that any money or property coming into the hands of any person is taxable as income unless specifically exempted. But we have found no case in which the court did not look to the source at least, sorry, as at least coloring or bearing upon the incident of taxation. So they're saying we disagree with that. We disagree. So now we're going to three. Now we're getting to punitive damages. Punitive damages seem to be sui generis by definite, which is unique. That means unique. Again, I mentioned our an earlier in the presentation that there's legal terms you need to know, and a lot of them are Latin. As you can see here, it's used. Sui generis, 
basically translates to unique. By definition, they are not compensatory. So punitive damages are not compensatory. They, are, they certainly possess no periodicity. They are not derived from capital, nor um, from labor, or from both combined, and assuredly they are not profit gained through the sale or conversion of capital assets, looking at the um, Iser versus McCumber. So that's the Iser versus McCumber language that they're bound by from the U.S. Supreme Court because that was, again, the main case, and that was still good law at the time. So they went through that analysis. They're saying, well, it's sure certainly not that. So, so far, we haven't got to the end of the case, but it's not looking good for the government. It's looking like the taxpayer is going to win here. It is clear that they do not fall within the definition of Eisenhower versus Cumber. Just wrote that, right? And we, if we could be certain the definition of that case was controlling, we would have no difficulty with the issue at bar. It is easy to say what punitive damages are not, but difficult to say what they are. So it's saying, hey, we can say what they're not. They're not capital. They're not labor. They're not combination. But we don't really know what they are. They smack, so they look like donations made by made sorry made to the individual by the state by operation of law, and that's like an interesting. Th this is where you start seeing the court and and how interesting they they of you know how their creative their arguments and how creative their rationale is. When this is a time when they didn't know what to do, and they're saying, okay, well, it's kind of like a gift by the state, a donation by the state, where the state is saying, okay, Hartford, you you did something bad. And you have to compensate Glenshaw Glass for what damage you did. Plus, we're going to make you pay two times more. So three times total, right? Three times the compensatory damages. Two times more th than that amount as a punishment. So it's an operation by law. It's like a donation. Like, oh, the state is kind of giving you this, this ability. A person does a prohibited act to another injuring him. The injured individual is subsequently enriched by a gift. So they kind of think of it like a gift. So isn't this interesting? They're basically saying that punitive damages in a way are kind of like a gift. So punitive damages are kind of like a gift because they're not really translated into anything specific and they think best it's like a gift by the state, gift by state. Really, really interesting thinking. Some of you are out there saying like, what? That's crazy. Well, again, you might be thinking that now because you know the rules, but when you're, oh, you know, you're first encountering an issue and how to decide on it, a lot of times you got to just think outside the box. So the injured individual is subsequently enriched by a gift taken from the pocket of the injuring party by virtue of law. There is no quid pro quo. So they focus on this quid pro quo, which makes it, that's why they think it's like a, a gift. An analogy seems to us to lie in those cases where contributions are made by the sovereign and the general public interest to an individual. See, I'm sorry, compare Edwards versus Cuba Railroad Company. And we saw it mentioned that one earlier. Where the injuries were gross, the doctrine of punitive damages comes into play. The taxpayers have recorded, sorry, recovered because the sovereign has seen fit to punish gross behavior for the good of the public. There are naked exactions by the sovereign which go to the injured corporations rather to, than to the fiscal. There is vague likeness to a fine exacted by the sovereign, but which goes to the taxpayer. So it looks like from that, they're saying that, hey, it looks more like a gift. It looks more like the Cuba. And from that, it seems like they're saying that the punitive damages should not be included. Then we have number four and five. Supreme Court has never expressly departed from the definition of income in Eisner. So they're basically saying, they give some citations that were tied to that, in which the Supreme Court expressly declined to overrule. So in these cases, it expressly declined to overrule Eisner. So it's saying Eisner is so important. The Culbertson decision, which we mentioned earlier, cites not only Treasury regulation, but also it cites um, some treatises, Mertens. We can see that no definition is too helpful. Look at Kirby Lumber, which deals with discharge of indebtedness being gross income. The decisions relating to income tax law contain charts rather than definitions, as Mr. Mertens has aptly stated. But it should be borne in mind that in Eisner versus McCumber, albeit where severability was the primary issue, the Supreme Court said on pages 206, 207, that the only a clear definition of the term income as used in common speech was required. We do believe that a windfall, which that's what they're viewing punitive damages as because it's just like, oh, you got this amount like you won the lottery kind of. I mean, not exactly, but you got this amount by law, no other reason. It's not to compensate you for your lost profits, your damages or reputation. Um, 
or, or whatnot or property. It's just a windfall. And the payments at bar where windfalls would not be regarded as income within the terms of common speech. So it's using common speech. So they're relying a lot on this idea of gift. They're relying on common speech. A windfall is not income. They're using a lot of layman's things. And that's one of the reasons why you're going to see later on that the Supreme Court is go ahead and, and give you the, the gist na later. now. We're going to see it. Is that the Supreme Court is going to overrule. We saw that earlier in the trial court, so I might as well tell you. So I'm going to stop it there. You can continue reading, but you see that they're pretty much saying that uh, this windfall punitive damages are not considered income. So they're saying that the not regard punitive damages as income, we must further concede the decision of the court in Central, which the Central case was was not, which viewed that issue as not income. So they're basically saying that the punitive damages is not income. And they conclude that. But we think if we if such a result is to be achieved after nearly two decades, it should be affected by the Supreme Court and not by this tribunal. So they're not going to overrule. They're not going to they're not going to overrule the decision. They're going to let the Supreme Court do so, not them. So they affirm the tax court. And that means that the taxpayer, the, the original party that won, won again. So in the trial court, the tax court, they held that the punitive damages were not gross income. Same holding here. All right, so now we've made it. We've made it all the way to the Supreme Court. The, the Supreme Court granted cert, and they're going to hear this case. So first thing is, let's look at the citation. Remember the trial court, the IRS lost. Circle of Appeals, Third Circuit, IRS lost. So again, they're going to be the the appellant. So Commissioner of Internal Revenue is the um, is the appellant. And then you've got Glenshaw Glass and this party as well. Now, sometimes in appeals courts, sometimes in appeals courts, they call the appellant the petitioner because they're petitioning the court. So that's what they mean there when they say petitioner. And they call the uh, appellee the respondent. I tend not to like to use that in tax because you get the petitioner respondent at the tax court level, which the petitioner at the tax court level is always a taxpayer and respondent is the IRS. So I don't like to use that because it gets confusing in that regard. I like to use appellant, appellee. So yes, it does say petitioner here, but really the IRS is the appellant and I like to use that language. Okay. So we've got some information. First thing we're told, it was argued in 1955, February 28th, decided, that's when the opinion came out, also 1955, and there was a rehearing which was denied, and they give a citation there. Citation is here, by the way, and again, this is the this is the federal, this is the U.S., but it's published by, um, it says West, at one point it was, now it's a GPO, and again, they give the head note, head note here, and they say what happens, proceedings on taxpayers' petition to challenge Commissioner of Internal Revenue's determination regarding tax income tax efficiencies. They talk about the lower court level. They talk about, they grant certiorari. Supreme Court Justice Chief Warren held that money received by settlement as exemplary damages for fraud and antitrust and as punitive damages. The two-thirds portion, as we talked about, was taxable. And then there's one justice that dissented. And they give the head notes, and we've gone through those, those already, numbers one through 10. And again, as we go further, you're going to see that the decision gets shorter and shorter. Notice in the Circuit Court of Appeals opinion, there was barely any discussion of the facts. They got right to the issue. Here's where the opinion starts. We've got the parties. Now, when you're getting to the Supreme Court, you're talking about high-level attorneys for both the government and for the taxpayer. We've got Mr. Chief Justice Warren delivered the opinion, and we got right to number one. So right here, boom, one, courts. This litigation involves two cases with independent factual backgrounds, yet presenting identical issue. The two cases were consolidated for argument before the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and were heard en banc. So that's, by the way, that's how I knew when I read through all this that it was en banc, but because, you know, there's only six six different judges. So it has to be, you know, that has to be all the judges are because en banc. The common question is whether money received as exemplary damages for fraud or as punitive two-third portion of trouble damage antitrust recovery Let's go to the next page. Recovery must be reported by a taxpayer as gross income under code section 22 of the Internal Revenue Code of 1939, which again, starting in 1954, became section 61 and also present in 
1986 tax code as well. In a single opinion, the Court of Appeals affirmed the tax court's separate rulings in favor of the taxpayers. Because of the frequent reoccurrence of the question and differing interpretations by the lower courts of this court's decisions bearing upon the problem, we granted cert to the, uh, to the Commissioner of Internal Revenue. So they explain why. The facts of the cases were largely stipulated and are not in dispute. So, the, so far as pertinent, they are as follows. And they go through the facts. Commissioner versus Glenshaw Glass. Glenshaw Glass Company, a Pennsylvania corporation, manufactures glass and bottle containers. It was engaged in protected litigation, sorry, protracted litigation with Hartford Empire Company, which manufactures machinery of a character used by Glenshaw. Among claims advanced by Glenshaw, blah, 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 blah. And they go through all that stuff and they come up with the punitive damages. Then they talk about the commissioner versus William Goldman Theaters and they talk about that. But the idea is that it ultimately comes down to the punitive damages from the treble damages. Number two, it's conceded by the respondents that there's no constitutional barrier to the imposition of tax on punitive damages. Our question is one of statutory construction. Are these payments, talking about this, the punitive damages, comprehended, included by section 22A? The sweeping scope of the controverted statute is readily apparent. And here's actually where we see section 22. If you want to open up to code section 61, you get an idea of how different they were, but also how similar. So section 22, and this is back from the 1939 tax code as of this year, when this was decided, 1955, subsection A, general definition, gross income includes gains, profits, and income derived from salaries, wages, or compensation for personal services. They left some stuff out of whatever kind and in whatever form paid or from professions, vocations, trade, businesses, commerce, or sales, or dealings in property, whether real or personal, growing out of the ownership or use of the interest, sorry, use of or interest in such property. Also, from interest, rent, dividend securities, or the transaction of any business carried on for gain or profit, and they italicize, which is important, or, we'll put this in, an arc, we'll put this in red, or, Gains or profits and income derived from any source whatsoever. Whenever the Supreme Court says emphasis added, that means that that is extremely important. So where, where they start italicizing or gains or profits and income derived from any source whatsoever, they are, it says emphasis added, it's extremely important. So we're continuing on. This court has frequently stated that this language was used by Congress to exert in this field the full measure of its taxing power. If you don't understand what's saying here, stop the video and look at the 16th Amendment. You will see that it says, from whatever source derived. So if you look at code section 61, you'll see it says, from whatever source derived. And that actually comes from the full authority of the, the Constitution in the amendment. And that's what they're saying here too. Or gains or profits and income derived from any source whatsoever. They're basically relabeling from whatever source derived, same, saying the same thing. So that's what they're saying here is that the court has frequently stated that this language was used by Congress to give the broadest possible ability to tax income. And they give a whole slew, it's a, it's a citation stew of you know, a string site of citations. So it's called string site. Respondents contend, so respondents are the appell, appellee, so that's the taxpayer, Respondents contend that the punitive damages characterized as windfalls flowing from the culpable conduct of third parties are not within the scope of the section, but Congress applied no limitations as to the source of taxable receipts nor restrictive labels as to their nature, and the court has given a liberal construction to this broad phraseology in recognition of the intention of Congress to tax all gains except those specifically exempted. They reference the Jacobson decision and a bunch of other decisions. When you start getting to these high level cases, they, they have lots of string sites like that. Thus, the fortuitous gain accruing to a lessor by reason of the forfeiture of a lessee's improvements on the rented property was taxed in Helvering v. Brune, which that case, by the way, dealt with a lessor and a lessee. Less, lessee pr um, provided uh, improvements on the lessor's property. And then when the, less, when the uh, lessee left, the lessor then received this property with these with this increase to the property, and the court basically held that 
that was considered gross income. And then basically code section, code section 109 was was uh, enacted because of that that issue, dealing with that with that respective um, issue in the code. Such decisions demonstrate that we cannot but ascribe con content to the catch-all provision of section 22A, gains or profits and income derived from any source whatsoever. Again, they keep focusing on that language. The importance of that phrase has been too frequently recognized since its first appearance in the Revenue Act of 1913, which that is the original Revenue Act. So it's been around since 1913, the, when we have our first income tax, to say now that it adds nothing to the meaning of gross income. So from the language so far, if you want to stop and just think, it seems like they're in favor of the government saying that it is indeed gross income. We don't know that 100% yet. I mean, we do because I've already kind of give you the gist of what happens, right? They're going to reverse. But if you didn't know that, you'd be leaning like they're saying yes, that the government is right and not the taxpayer, right? That, it, that punitive damages are gross income because they're basically saying, okay, well, we're gains for profits and income derived from any source whatsoever. They're basically saying that and, and, and the, the taxpayers are making the argument, well, windfalls aren't included in that. And Basically, the court's saying, well, it doesn't matter. Congress used the, the full full force, full full broadness, and just because it's not labeled in there doesn't matter. It's, 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 it's broad language. Nor can we accept respondent's contention that a narrow, so they're saying they don't agree with the, with the previous thing or this one. Nor can we accept the respondent's contention that a narrow reading of section 22A is required by the court's characterization of income in Eisner versus McCumber as the gain derived from capital, from labor, or from both combined. The court was there endeavoring to determine whether the distribution of corporate stock dividend constituted a realized gain to the shareholder or changed only the form, not the essence of his initial capital investment. By the way, this is what happened in Eisner. It was about a uh, stock distribu distribution. That's what it dealt with. It dealt with, they're just giving you the idea. So basically what the court's saying here in, in uh, Glenshaw Glass Supreme Court case Justice, uh, the Chief Justice Warren, basically what it's saying is the court's saying that the, the taxpayers want us to interpret the Eisner decision more narrowly than it is, but we're not going to do that. We're going to hold it broad. And there's actually been cases before this, like New Colonial Ice, where the courts have said that as a matter of or deductions are, ma are matters of legislative grace, they're, me they're meant to be interpreted uh, narrowly, but income is meant to be interpreted broadly. And that's one of my top 40 tax doctrines, one of my tax themes I talk about. Very important. Let's continue on. It was held by the taxpayer, sorry, it was held that the taxpayer had received nothing out of the company's assets for a separate use and benefit. So talking about Eisner. The distribution therefore was not, sorry, was held not a taxable event. In that context, distinguishing gain from capital the definition served a useful purpose, but it was not meant to provide a touchstone to all future gross income questions. And it references Hellering Brief Brun, which is the lesser case, which again is a case where the court did hold for gross income. Here we go four. Here we have instances of undeniable accessions of wealth clearly realized over which taxpayers have complete dominion. That language right there, that is, we'll do red. some of the most important language in the entire tax law. That language is the first time that we see the Supreme Court, which of course is the highest law in the land, define gross income. And that's still the standard that we use today of what is gross income. It's those three things. Undeniable accession to wealth, clearly realized, over which the taxpayer has dominion control. So some of the most important language ever written by the court is right there in that sentence. Because that is what tremendously helps us define gross income. Define gross income is still extremely difficult, but it's provided us a lot of guidance. So here we have an instance. So it's saying that here we have an instance of undeniable accession to wealth clearly realized over which taxpayer has complete dominion. The mere fact that the payments were extracted from the wrongdoers as punishment for unlawful conduct cannot detract from their character as taxable income to the recipient. So just because they did something bad doesn't mean that, oh, you get off the hook, taxpayer. That's, regard that's irrelevant. Respondents concede, as they must, the recoveries are taxable to the extent that they compensate for damages incurred. So let's highlight that as well. Very important. Because it's getting at the respondents, the taxpayers, basically saying that 
recovery of certain items should be excluded from income, as we mentioned earlier. It would be an anomaly that could not be justified in the absence of clear congressional intent to say that a recovery for actual damages is taxable, but not the additional amount extracted as punishment for the same conduct that which caused the injury. So they're saying that, okay, the recovery of damages for the actual damages, for uh, com compensating them for property or reputation, that should be excluded. But the, the punitive damage portion of that, which is this windfall, no, that should not be excluded. That's what they're saying. And we find no such evidence of intent to exempt these payments. So they looked, they're actually referencing, they don't provide any citations. They're saying that they looked at congressional history. So they have no, there's no congressional history. That's what they think that supports this view that, that, um, that punitive damages should not be taxed as gross income or should not be in gross income. And then we have items five and 10. It is urged that reenactment of section 22 without change since the board of tax appeals held punitive damages non-taxable in Highland Farms indicates congressional satisfaction that hold with that holding. Reenactment particularly, so they're basically saying, hey, maybe, I mean, we're, 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 we are the courts. We, uh, we can hold that this is taxable, but we also think that maybe Congress should um, make section 22 a little bit more clearer. Reenactment, particularly with out the slightest affirmation, sorry, affirmative indication that Congress ever had the Highland Farms decision before it, is an unreliable indictum at best. They provide some sites. Moreover, the commissioner promptly published his non acquiescence, which we talked about non acquiescence in our administrative rulings uh, topic, administrative rulings and uh, administrative authority. That's where the that's where the uh, IRS they issue a statement saying they don't agree with the the holding and they're going to continue fighting it in court. They're going to continue saying that they they're going to continue going even though they lost the case. They're going to continue the same arguments. So moreover, the commissioner promptly published his non acquiescence in this portion of the Highland Farms holding and has before and since consistently maintained the position that these receipts are taxable. So they continue to hold punitive damages are taxable. It therefore cannot be said without certitude that Congress intended to carve an exception out of Section 22A's per pervasive coverage. Nor does the 1954's code, so now it's in 1954, and they're actually going to 1954, legislative history with its reiteration of the proposition that statutory gross income is all-inclusive, and that's Section 60, that's more similar to Section 61, give support to respondents' position. So even though this actually involved a, a tax law where the 1939 tax code applied. They actually looked at the 1954 code to even see if there was any reference there, even though it's not really strong. It's not binding, but it could provide some type of guidance. So really the main thing here was they said, okay, well, this is an undeniable extension of wealth clearly realized over which a taxpayer has dominion control. And that's the, the over complete dominion, I should say. And that's the first time they use that. And they're saying that it meets those criteria. So certainly punitive damages cannot reasonably be classified as gifts. And they're even saying that, which they're saying, hey, lower court, that's not possible. Nor do they come under any other exemption provision in the code. We would do violence to the plain meaning of the statute and restrict a clear legislative t attempt to taxing power to bear upon all receipts constitutionality, sorry, constitutionally taxable were, to, were we to say that the payments in question here are not gross income. So basically saying that they would do pain and damage basically if they ruled that these were not gross income. And then they reversed the lower court and Justice Douglas dissents and Justice Harlan did not take place. Again, remember that Supreme Court has nine justices at the time of this video and usually all of them hear the case. Sometimes they recuse themselves like Justice Harlan took no part in the consideration. Justice Douglas had dissented but did not issue opinion. It would be, it would be issued after this immediately in the, um, you see dissent, but there's not one there. So we've gone through everything. We've done a lot. Now let's talk about the brief. Let's go through the brief now. So we're going to write a case brief together on the Glenshaw Glass Company, and we're going to focus on the SCOTUS case, the Supreme Court case, the last one, because that's obviously the most important. It reversed the previous two decisions. So remember, and on those previous slides, if you want to go back, I show you the, the format. The first thing we have is the citation. And remember, we're dealing with the Supreme Court case, not the trial court, the tax court, or the court of appeals. So we have a commissioner. And you go back and look at the actual citation on the opinion. Commissioner 
versus Glenshaw Glass. I'm going to do the abbreviation company, comma, and we put the reporter. So it's the U.S. official reporter. So three, four, eight, and again, this came from the actual reporter on that page. Three, four, eight, U.S. 426, and the year it was decided was 1955. Now we're going to do the procedural history. Now I'm going to keep this pretty, pretty simple, as simple as I can. I'm just going to go ahead and put the citations at the lower level. Again, we've got Glenshaw Glass. Make them small here. Make these smaller. Glenshaw Glass Company versus Commissioner. So remember, at the tax court, the taxpayer's name always goes first because they are the petitioner. So 18t.c.860, and that was decided in 1952. And then we'll put a line here, separate these. And then the third core appeals affirmed. So it's affirmed. Commissioner versus Glenshaw Glass company. And the reason why commissioner goes first is because remember at the third trial at the trial court, the tax court level, Glenshaw Glass won the decision. And the, so commissioner is the appellant. And the we, we say it's affirmed because the third circuit, they affirmed the lower court, the tax court's decision. So commissioner versus Glenshaw Glass company. And the citation for that one, again, you go back, you can look at this. 211 Federal 2nd 928. We put the circuit. So that's the third circuit 1954. And then if you wanted to put the cert grant citation, you can do that as well. But obviously, it was heard by the Supreme Court, so we know it was granted by the cert. Another thing is that we saw in the Supreme Court case, we saw the um, subsequent procedural history that the rehearing was denied. You can also cite that as well, but I'm not going to do that here for, for the sake. But if you wanted a more official, formal, you could obviously put that. But these are the, the three cases that matter. And this tells a lot, right? Because we know, okay, it was at the tax court. We know that from the first cite. And... We know that the taxpayer won at the tax court level because when it comes to the Third Circuit, the first party, the appellant, is the IRS. And we know that the Third Circuit affirmed the taxpayer's decision or the decision for the, ta for the taxpayer. So taxpayer won again at the Circuit Court Appeals level. And in Supreme Court, we're going to find out what the holding is. But that's the idea is that by knowing the citations and knowing where the parties go and understanding from this video where, what parties are where, you know, okay, where it started, originated, originated the tax court. You know who won the tax court by looking at the, the lower court, right? It says, okay, commissioners first. So that means that the taxpayer won. And then also, you know that the Third Circuit, they affirmed the lower court. And because we know the lower court won, you know that the Third Circuit, the taxpayer won as well. And going to the Supreme Court, that's going to be important because we're going to see that the holding is, they're going to be reversing. So now we go and put the facts next. We want to keep these as short as possible. As you know from the original trial court opinion, it gets really, it gets real challenging. So the facts, SCOTUS, Supreme Court of the United States is the abbreviation, consolidated two cases. Remember we had Glenshaw Glass and we had the movie, but remember the citation, it deals with both of these. So consolidated two cases, two cases with a similar issue. And that issue dealt with punitive damages. And specifically, in both cases, the taxpayers 
So I like to abbreviate a lot of times because again, this is not an official thing you're writing. This is just for to keep your memory. So taxpayers, TPs, taxpayers did not report punitive damages as gross income in both cases. They both they came from treble damages, right? But really, it deals with punitive damages. It applies to punitive, treble, um, the punitive portion of treble damages. It applies across the board. Okay, so we have our facts. So then we have the issue. Issue's pretty short. Now, if you want to be official, it's the Supreme Court's asking, did the, did the lower court err in, in its decision? That's the official way. It depends on who you ask. You know, there's more sticklers. I think the issue, the best way to phrase it is, are punitive damages received by a taxpayer included in gross income? Next is the holding. So we can put that down. Punitive damages are gross income or included in gross income, whatever you want to phrase it. You can phrase it either way. I'm trying to abbreviate. Also, you would want to note that there was a dissent by Justice Douglas, but no opinion. I'm going to leave that one out just for, um, again, for the sake of this demonstration. So what really is left is the analysis, the analysis portion. You can also do rules as well. Um, I like to combine the analysis and rules. So let's talk about that. So analysis, first thing the court focused on Congress in enacting section 22, which is Section 61, as of the 1954 tax code, so just as of 1954, intended to tax all gains except those exempted. So the idea is that there's the broad language that we that the, the court focused on, right? And that from whatever source derived. Then a really important element, remember we went through and I, I, I took that bracket around that language. The court held the amounts, the punitive damages received by the taxpayers were instances of undeniable excisions to wealth. It's the first part. Clearly realized and Dominion and control met. So first part of it is undeniable accession to wealth. Second part is that they're clearly realized by the taxpayer. And third is that the taxpayer has met complete dominion and control of the items. And this three-part test for determining income is broader. So let me zoom out a little bit. So we can add some space here. This three-part test is broader, right? Remember, we have the broad intention of the language, basically, is what they were focusing on. The three-part test is broader than the previous 
Eisner case and the Supreme Court sets this, let's zoom out a little bit more, as the new standard of what is gross income. So the Supreme Court did not overrule Eisner. It still said Eisner was important, but it basically said that, okay, Eisner dealt with a um, stock distribution and we need to to have a more a more general application and, and and people need to stop relying on Eisner. That's basically what they did. Is they created this new test. That was the key of this case. This new test, there's three elements, and we're going to say that all three elements are met here. So you need to meet all three of these. You need to have an undeniable accession to wealth, clearly realized, and domain control. And from later cases, we find that undeniable accession to wealth just means your assets, uh, your net worth goes up. So maybe your assets go up and your liabilities stay the same or go down. So when you have punitive damages, your assets go up. It's realized, which means you have severance, which is severable, which they focus on specifically with the Eisner case with uh, labor and capital. And then domain control just means that there's no strings attached. You can do whatever you want with the proceeds. It's not like you find uh, a wall of money in the parking lot you turned into lost and found. And you know they say, oh, well, we have to keep this for a year, but if no one collects it after a year, you get it then when you find it, that's not the issue. That's the idea. So this three-part test is broader than previous Eisner case, and SCOTUS sets this as a new standard for defining gross income. And that's really everything. GI is gross income. So again, the analysis, the court really focused on that broad language and focus on that broad language of code section 22, right? that from whatever source derived language, right? The Here, put that from whatever source derived. That's actually a language in code section 61, but it's very similar. It's like from whatever deri um, deriving from a source or something like that, from all sources. It's very similar language. You can just see it's just written a little bit differently. But the, the court focused on that. It said, it says, you, you know, the, the taxpayers are saying, well, it, it's not like this case. It's not like that case. And basically the Supreme Court said, it doesn't matter. Congress intended this to be broad. They used the entire the entire force they could from the Constitution. They wanted income to encompass everything. Didn't have to be from limited situations of, of transactions from capital or this and 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 you know we don't and we also don't think that it should follow the the Eisner. And by the way, we think Eisner is just getting a little outdated because everyone keeps relying on that. So we created this new standard and the new standard is you need three things to have gross income. Undeniable accession to wealth clearly realized and dominion control and all three of those things are met in this case before us with the with the punitive damages all three of those are met again later later cases kind of refine what those mean they didn't really talk about those here but later cases go in depth with what those mean and that's what we have currently in our law so this was a really important area of law glenshaw glass is very important because it sets up that three-part test and that's why the analysis section of case brief is one of the most important things right you've got the citation of course so other people can look you can find it real easy just by going to the site You've got the procedural history, which again, you have the sites, also gives you an idea of who won, give the facts, the important facts, keep that as short as possible. The issue and the holding, and then the analysis of, of course is the star of the show because it gives how the court reasoned through its analysis and it also gives a new test that we apply to gross define gross income and it's still used today. All right, so I hope you've enjoyed this really long one, woo! But judicial sources of law is very difficult. Please make sure you watch this as many times as you, as you need to understand. Go back over the opinion reading. Go back over the case brief. This is all meant to help you. It's going to help you tremendously in practice. And make sure you watch the other videos as well.